Hi, welcome Saurabh to the interview. And yeah, uh, thank I've got you. a CV in front of me. And uh, yep, so just to let you know that this call will be recorded uh, for uh, on the social media like YouTube and others, and uh, that you are okay with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it. Okay, all right. Uh, so yep, uh, I've got your CV in front of me. So why don't we start up with uh, your career progression and uh, and then we'll have some follow-up questions. Yeah, like first of all, thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity, you know, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Saurabh uh, Ravankar. Uh, uh, I will start with how I got into the DevOps and cloud uh, technology domain. So I did my bachelor's of engineering in mechanical field. But uh, whilst I was in third year, I got interested into the computer science. So then I started learning about the Python, from basics of Python. And then later during the COVID period, period that's when I met my mentor. He uh, like taught me a lot of DevOps and cloud technologies. And uh, the most important thing he did was not only taught, but he created my interest in that field genuinely. So I really followed that. And uh, whilst I was in fourth year, I got my opportunity in one of the largest consultancy company in India. And since then, I've been working there as a DevOps and cloud engineer uh, for two and a two year and four months as of now. So that's a uh, uh, little bit about my work uh, related things. Uh, about my personal things, I live in the uh, town of Maharashtra. Uh, my hobbies are like, I like to read books. I also like to work out and just stroll in the nature. So yep. yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, all right. So I see from your resume, Saurabh, that uh, you have uh, experience in AWS, uh, Code Pipeline, CI, CD, uh, Python and Lambda. Uh, also used Amazon QuickSight for visualizations and dashboard. So how, how, about, uh, how about Docker and Kubernetes? Yeah, I also know a Docker and Kubernetes. Okay, all right. All right, let's start up with some of the AWS questions. So I'll start right from the basics. Uh, so in terms of AWS security, so there's something called as uh, NACLs. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me more about NACLs and uh, uh, how does it, how's it how does it differ from subnets? Yeah, so NACLs are the firewalls uh, applied at the subnet level. Uh, there is another thing called a security group in AWS, uh, which somehow relates to it. Security, but there is a difference that NACLs are stateless. So it means that you have to specify specifically the inbound as well as outbound rule. Whether mm -hmm. as the security groups which are attached at the individual resource level, like instances, uh, they are stateful. So you just have to mention like inbound, and they will automatically gather that uh, outbound is also allowed. Mm -hmm. So that's what a NACL is. Right. Uh, now, in terms of your EC2, uh, there is something called as volumes, which can be attached. Right? Yes. Uh, you've got elastic block, uh, block stores uh, and volumes. Uh, can yeah, you tell yeah. me what are the different types of volumes and uh, and what do they're used for? Yeah. So, like volumes are the like persist are mounted for having the persistent storage to our EC2 servers, and the block storage is the EBS that AWS offers. Uh, in terms of different types of uh, volumes, so there are like GP2, which are like uh, SSD based. Then there are uh, IOPS uh, heavy uh, volumes, so where you can have, a, if you want the uh, have application that has heavy read IO, then you can use the IOPS type of uh, volumes. Then there are also some machine learning related uh, volumes, I guess. I don't remember uh, them particularly, but yeah, so mm -hmm. these are some types of. Uh, volumes. Right. So I'll just give you a scenario, and uh, you can explain me uh, on the on the questions on it. Okay. So let's yeah. say uh, you've got a three tier or a four tier application, uh, and you are asked to design the application from scratch. Uh, so you've got mm -hmm. an app, app layer, uh, you've got an API layer, uh, you've got uh, the business logic, uh, you've got web layer, you've got databases, uh, you're using S3. So so these these it's a standard sort of application. So in terms of cloud security, how would you secure an application and what are the different uh, attributes that you would have in your application to make it uh, consistently secure? Okay, so let's start with the things that I will include. Uh, so first is database layer, second is application layer, and third is suppose the client accessing the things from internet. So that's three tier. So I would probably use a API gateway or application load balancer in this architecture where I will put just the ALB or API gateway in the public uh, subnet where it has access to the external internet. 
and i will put my app server in different private subnet and i will put my database server in different private subnet and then just connect my api gateway alb to the private web server and web servers will have access to the database servers privately and yeah like uh, and the clients can access my application on, on the ip address or domain name of the alb which are mapped to it so that is how i would uh, like architect it okay are there any other security measures that you can think of yeah like we can have the like if your web server needs access to the database and suppose your database is in rds so you can have a proper iam permissions iam instance profile for your instances uh, in web servers also you can have proper knackles uh, the security groups following the list privileges uh, rule as the aws uh, suggests uh, so those are some of the security things that you can take in consideration anything else that you can think of uh you can also add uh, like aws wap or something like that if you want the extra security so if you want ddos protection so maybe mm -hmm. you can use wap and uh, if you want to like check the your instances for like uh, security vulnerability then maybe use the aws inspector or something like that okay last chance to say something else uh I'm looking for one more point you did well but one more point there is uh ppc there is subnet there's alb uh security groups is there iam is there uh All maybe right. like storing the database passwords or something like that you can use uh, secrets manager for that yeah uh, how, how about how about you how would you secure a data tell me about data encryption so data encryption if it's in transit then you can use the obviously ssl for that ssl certificates uh mm -hmm. And if it's at the rest, then you can, in terms of AWS, you can use a service like AWS KMS, uh, where you can have different options for managing the keys. Either AWS can manage me it or like you can manage it and uh, you can encrypt the data at rest using those keys. Okay. Can you tell me the difference between a server side encryption and client side encryption? Yeah. So I would say server side encryption is something that uh, we do, like as a app server where like uh, suppose data is at rest so that's where you are uh, encrypting your data so that's i would say server side encryption and client side encryption is something that if client is sending the data then you are using the ssl uh, key uh, that public key to encrypt the data so i would say that would be client side encryption okay all right uh now coming back to tell me tell me why would you why would you need auto scaling and what are the different types of auto scalings available uh so auto scaling is required if you have a varying terms of traffic to your applications and you want to automatically scale your instances or containers whatever uh type of deployment you have done and uh, so you don't need manual intervention suppose the traffic is uh, exceeding beyond uh, what your cpu levels can handle so you don't need to manually increase go and increase the number of servers and set up everything so for that we can use uh, something like auto scaling groups where you already have the pre configured uh, launch templates that uh, and you can give it uh, various metrics so sg can scale based on like uh, metric based so like uh, suppose average cpu utilization it can also you uh, like scale based on maybe number of requests going to per instance so that is another thing or you can create your own custom metric uh, whatever you want and then scale based using that metric uh, for your needs okay uh, now have you have you done any sort of monitoring on on any applications uh, i have not done as per se but i use cloudwatch whenever i like require to like check something if something has happened or something but i haven't done specifically monitoring i have to created the dashboards using quicksight uh, uh, which is the native aws services mm -hmm. where we have monitored the like things like cost of our accounts and like uh, different s3 bucket size and everything else mm -hmm. okay all right can you explain me this term connection draining connection draining so basically it means that your connection is going to die like uh, it's it's finishing up all the things and it's uh, draining uh, it's uh, removing the connection so so what what does it do uh connection draining uh, you're talking in terms of specific something or just general term connection drain so so, so if an application is go going to die what does the connection draining do uh so it uh, if there are any pending requests it will finish up those requests and then it will go down it will uh, like close that connection okay yep right 
All right. Uh, now let's talk something about on the Docker and Kubernetes. So we do, we do have Docker. Uh, can you explain me the role of Kubernetes in Docker? So Kubernetes is the Docker a container orchestration platform. What it means is that it comes on top of Docker. So Docker uh, natively does, does not provide things like auto scaling, auto healing, or uh, uh, maybe load balancer type of things, uh, which the any enterprise level of application would require. So that's where a Kubernetes come. It adds a lot of feature that an enterprise require in order to operate their application. Uh, Docker does have something called Docker Swarm, but it's uh, not, I would say, uh, like uh, fulfills the requirement needed for the enterprise level of application. You can use it for small application, but I won't say for enterprise. Okay. So now in Kubernetes, there's something called as image pool policy. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me about that? So image pool policy is, uh, suppose you have created a Docker file and you want to specify your Docker file that when do you pull the image. So you can mention in image pool policy that if the image is not present locally, then you can pull it uh, from the registry. Okay. And what are the different uh, values that it accepts? Uh, I know one because I have used that one that it's if not present in uh, current repository, but for others, maybe I'll need to like look up in documentation. Yeah, that's all right. So there are, there are two more, always and never. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, kind of. All right. So what do you understand by a service in Kubernetes and how many different types of services are there? Uh, so service is used uh, to offer features like uh, I said, load balancing. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has a feature called auto discovery. So it uh, automatically discovers the new instances coming up in your uh, cluster uh, for that specific application. And it does that by using the uh, thing called as selectors and levels. Uh, services has three types. The first is the cluster IP, which is default. It means that the whatever service you are exposing to the external world, it, uh, it sorry, whatever services you are exposing, it's only available within the cluster itself. Second is the node port, which means that the services are available to the clients or the servers that has access to the node on which the Kubernetes cluster is running. And third is the load balancer where the cloud providers come in picture where you can expose it to the external world by using external application load balancers like ALB, ALB. All right. Uh, now in Kubernetes, you have got deployments and you have got daemon sets. Yeah. Can you tell me the difference between both of them? I remember deployment. I don't remember daemon set to be honest. The deployment is basically for uh, if you want to uh, deploy your application and have the capability as I say auto healing or auto scaling. So that's when you can use a uh, deployment. In deployment, you can mention different strategies like a uh, rolling uh, deployment or uh, maybe blue green deployment, something like that. So that's what we use the deployment. I can't remember demon set. I have read about that, but I have not used it. All right. So deployment makes the pod available in any node. But demons, yeah. it, it makes sure that the replica runs in each and every node. In the... Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, about RDS, uh, can you tell me that the different types of uh, SQL and NoSQL databases and what's the difference between them? The RDS is the service offered by AWS called the Relational Database Services. Uh, so, Relational means the SQL, which means the structured databases. So that uh, has various things like PostgreSQL, then MySQL, MSQL, uh, uh, like that. And um, uh, the other type of uh, database service is the NoSQL type, uh, which is uh, things like DynamoDB or um, uh, like MongoDB. Uh, so where your data is not structured and the data is stored in a key value kind of uh, format rather than the structured column wise format in SQL. Okay. Uh, any more differences that you can think of? Uh, you can like uh, NoSQL is very scalable. Uh, like DynamoDB, you can store like millions and billions of record in it. And it's very resilient in terms of it. Whereas your MySQL is not meant for that purpose. All right. So now coming back to your experience, uh, can you tell me about a, about a scenario where um, you really struggled in some of the cases or something that was very hard to do and then uh, what happened to that finally did you achieve it or not okay mm, so yeah um like recently there was a once uh, as i might have mentioned in my resume that i also work on security things 
So there was recently one finding that came that uh, our clients had lots of Lambda functions running uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the AWS Lambda and all of them were using the runtimes which were deprecated by the AWS. So that means there were no security patches, nothing, and it could be vulnerable to the security vulnerabilities. And there were around 1300 functions which our clients had on Lambda and uh, no one, like I took the responsibility to upgrade it then uh, and 800 and 50 were around Python and rest of the were of Node.js. So for Node.js, I took help of someone else in my team who uh, has the experience on Node.js, whether as Python, I myself have uh, the experience. So I did them on my own. So the challenges I faced in that was their Lambda. So there are two types, uh, types of functions. So one that uses the layers and one that does not use this layer. So the one that does not use this layer, it was easy to upgrade them. So I just created a simple Python script. And because the Python syntax for 3.7 and 3.9 was almost similar, there were no differences or nothing that needs to be changed. So that I uh, completed like in just few days. And then there were the next set of functions that were the layers one. So in that I had to like done, do some manual things also where like I automated the process of creating and updating layers by using the AWS CLI. So the layers were updated, but then I had to contact to the various team. Those were the, uh, handling those applications, uh, uh, those functions. And then, yeah, so it was, like a big process and at first I thought like 1300 functions that's a lot and like how can I complete this but it needed to do that so yeah I completed it and I almost at the end so I have around 150 functions remaining out of those 1300 and yeah I will be finishing it in just few days okay that. uh all right I I think I'm done with the the questions and answers uh so my feedback to you is that you did pretty well uh you answered uh, almost all the questions and uh Yep. So I'll be closing up this recording now and I'll be giving you more uh, feedback after the recording is done. Thanks for your okay. time. Today, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, if you can help me explain a little bit about your uh, profile, uh, what sort of skill set you have, uh, what sort of experience you bring, some of the responsibilities that you have been handling in your last role. And uh, from there we can start. Oh, sure. Definitely. Yes, I do have four years of experience. Uh, my current company is Golden City Digital Technologies, where I'm working as a cloud engineer. So here I got an opportunity to explore three different clouds. That's AWS, Azure, and GCP, uh, where the major focus was on FinOps cost optimization uh, methodologies. Uh, like uh, we worked on different uh, services in AWS, like uh, including EKS, Redshift, EMR, ECR, Cloud, uh, CloudWatch, CloudTrail. So what we usually do is we analyze the service, we test the service using APIs and CLIs. We also use Postman, and um, we are also using uh, MongoDB uh, and SQL DB. We use Robo3T for that, and uh, for SQL, we do use SQL Studio. So we analyze the service, test the service, and then define the policy. So we do have a uh, subcategory in uh, FinOps, like uh, idle, a uh, service being idle, it is being orphaned. What and, does your company do? Uh, majorly focused on cloud technologies. But uh, like, what do you offer through that? Do you train people, build some products? Uh, yes, we are also focusing on building uh, a product as well, but not yet uh, fully fledged. Um, like we are integrating different technologies, um, like we do have DevOps tools, so we are trying out new methods. But as of now, we provide services to clients. Um, that's the major focus as of now. So it's a service provider like any right. other. OK, so which is your but we are also. Uh, exploring different things. Yes, I worked for Criteria Networks. I'm uh, now currently working for uh, CoreStack, and um, I'm also planning to work uh, for uh, Terraform as well. That's with Syndria, a US client. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the new project we are getting. Okay, so you right work now. with different uh, these customers, Plans. and then you implement based on their skills, their requirements, what 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 they require. Yes, we provide the service and we are also exploring uh, uh, new products as well to build as our company owned product. Cool. And uh, so it's a multi cloud uh, experience, you said, right? All the yes. cloud providers and okay, uh, three cloud providers. Okay. So, which is your strong uh, area then? Uh, which is your strong cloud platform that you work on? Uh, AWS. 
OK, and which but as of now, I'm um, also comfortable with uh, Azure because um, I worked for almost one and a half year and uh, as well as GCP, but most of the services are from AWS and uh, Azure GCP, a few of them altogether around uh, 40 plus services we have worked on and uh, we do provide the entire logic like using when you say we provide it's you have those that experience, right? Not your company. Uh, yes, not my company. It's uh, you are working on that, right? So, uh, I mean, I was just telling the team. Uh, I worked on like 20 plus services. So we do have a team where we uh, coordinate with each other. We review whatever the policies they have defined or I have defined. So that way we have exposure to many services. I see you, you are certified. It's like 50 well. plus service. Yes, AWS. Associate and these are valid cert certifications right now? Yes, yes, okay. it's valid. All right. Um, OK, I, I got yes. a good idea uh, on uh, the profile. So I, I wanted to understand you mentioned a bit about cost optimization. Uh, so mm -hmm. what sort of is it a customer requirement to work on cost optimization? Uh, uh, yes, so uh, Postac mainly focus on FinOps, so they want to reduce the cost in the client uh, accounts. So what we do is first we test in uh, dev environment how our logic works. So for example, if I have to give um, a simple say EC2 instance, uh, now we go with uh, say idle policy. So what do we do is we check with the metrics. For example, CPU and memory utilization. We have a threshold say 5%. If it is less than that, then the customer is not using and it is a waste of time having that in their environment. So we tell that uh, customers that uh, this is of no use since you're not using it for a certain period. Period. Mm -hmm. um, and we also um, provide them how the cost uh, works as well, whether it is billing logic or unit rate logic. Uh, we have a complex policies as well, so which uh, have really helped the customers uh, uh, in cutting down the cost. But then this, there are a lot of tools, right? They provide these kind of reports. Uh, there's, is there anything beyond that? Uh, do you like identifying idle resources is one case for uh, uh, optimization? Anything else? Uh, do you understand reserved instances? Yes, yes. Spot instances, reserve, dedicated host. Yes, we uh, not only worked on the simple terms, uh, complex conflict policies as well. For example, a service might have different compute tires. And uh, for example, if I talk about file store in GCP, it has uh, enterprise uh, basic standard. So we analyze uh, uh, what enterprise features are, what standard features are, and what basic features are, whether customer is using all those features to its optimum level. If it's not being used to how to detect that and how uh, cost uh, reducing happens if we ask them to switch over that and we also recommend them as well so based on the we just provide what all the alternative recommendations they can use but it's uh, completely based on client uh, whichever the recommendation is suitable for them they're going to use that for example if some customer mm -hmm. is running their workloads in uh, eks maybe mm -hmm. what all areas you will analyze for cost optimization so for example, uh, uh, AWS EKS, first we'll check whether we have a master uh, node and uh, worker nodes. So we'll check whether the, since work, master node is a passive, we will not be doing anything there. Worker nodes will analyze what type of instance they are using it, whether they, they are uh, using it to its optimum level. If that particular instance, is, uh, instance type is not being used to its optimum level, uh, GCP, whatever, I mean, uh, uh, memory and uh, CPU, whatever the instance type provide, if they are not using, we'll ask them to shift to a distance, a different instance type. And also we do have uh, pods as well. So we do recommend a horizontal pod auto scaling, vertical pod auto scaling. If uh, the uh, pods are not being used, we do have metrics for pod using kubectl. Uh, we analyze the mes those metrics, whether the pods are being used completely or not on pod level, on instance level, on container level also we did, but uh, not to um, uh, not uh, uh, optimum cost optimization we can we could obtain on con uh, container level, but on pod and instance level we have worked on it. And if you have to optimize the container images, uh, that also is a big space, right? Like big challenge. Yes, yes. It's a okay. complex. Uh, OK, uh, what about your DevOps uh, area? Um, are you comfortable? Yes, with from, DevOps? 
Uh, yes, from past five months, uh, I've been trained on that, uh, basically on Kubernetes. So all the uh, basic concepts like what is DevOps, uh, what are the tools used in DevOps, uh, how it works. So basically, Can I you explain a sort of uh, a pipeline structure uh, and what tools uh, and technologies you would use. Uh, sure. So in DevOps, we first uh, go with the planning and then the source code and then build testing. And then we have um, uh, after testing, we do release and then uh, operate and monitor continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, and then continuous um, uh, continuous development, continuous uh, first is continuous uh, development, continuous integration, continuous uh, uh, deployment, and then the configuration management, and then we have a con uh, continuous monitoring. So first, uh, if we I'm using a DevOps planning tool, uh, that's nothing but uh, Azure boards we are using from past uh, two years, where we plan uh, uh, what is the project about and. Uh, uh, what comes under the projects like Epic, uh, under that we ha do have subcategories as features and then we have user story and then tasks. So that's the planning tool which I'm using. Uh, that's Azure Boats. And next comes the source code. Source code, uh, a big bucket, uh, SVN and uh, GitHub. Mainly I worked on uh, uh, GitHub only. So um, uh, GitHub, I have experience on uh, Git stash, uh, stash conflict, how to uh, solve that and uh, master branch, uh, how to create a uh, user branch and uh, merge it to the uh, remote repo, repo from local to uh, remote and then uh, pull requests. So uh, that's I've worked on. I've not worked on SVN and Bitbucket, so only GitHub. And then uh, uh, next comes the containerization tool integration tool containerization tool is a uh, docker, docker compose docker file and then we have um, integration tool jenkins the bamboo uh, i worked on jenkins so where uh, i'll create um, a build pipeline um, i worked on a maven how will jenkins talk to azure uh, or azure devops you, you mentioned started with yeah. uh, yes i have uh, implemented using a helm chart so during uh, so we create what I have done is uh, I have created a, a Azure AKS uh, in Azure portal and then um, uh, I have uh, uh, then implemented Jenkins on it using the Helm chart and then I have uh, manually as well as scripted not much but manually I've done uh, a lot of things like building the pipeline. Uh, Terraform, yes, I'm, I'm learning uh, Where does a Terraform little bit of into this one. Uh, Terraform is infrastructure code just to uh, automate so in, the infrastructure. In the project where uh, mm. you have uh, uh, for AKS Azure, and Azure, yeah, Azure AKS. Yeah, I've not worked on uh, AWS uh, EKS, but Azure AKS I've uh, tried with the Terraform code. Uh, still, I'm learning, so we do have a new project coming up uh, where we have to um, give a test and then enter into the project. So for that, we are still working on it. So for a case, yes, we have used the Terraform code. So using and Terraform, you have created the the APS, APS in Azure portal. portal. Yes, so, uh, but you, are conflict, you are you are giving conflicting messages. You have created in Azure portal or you have created the cluster using Terraform. Uh, both I have tried out. First, I have need to know how it works in the portal. So after which I have shifted to uh, code okay. because that's the automation. Because, because I usually what I do is I go with the portal experience, like how mm -hmm. exactly it works and then with the code. Because on code, I don't have much experience. So that's easy to see how it works. And we also provided cost optimization on that. Uh, and then um, Terraform code we have used. Any, any experience with Ansible? Ansible, no much experience. Configuration management tool for upgrades. Uh, we're going to use it, playbooks and all. Yes, I don't have much uh, experience, but I love to work on those tools as well. Because uh, my you next... uh, at other companies as well. Like how how many weeks uh, have you started trying for new position? And uh, I just started from last week. How is the market? You're getting a lot of calls. How, how is the scenario? Uh, from past one week i just got uh, through two three calls one is for uh, cognizant the other is for mind tree the market is good you you getting calls yes, that for, for devops and cloud right yes based on your mainly you have cloud experience i believe right uh, how is your linux uh, skill set yeah initially i worked on linux itself uh, so I do have good experience on that uh, where I used to managers manage uh, user accounts uh, creating the users and then providing permissions ACL access control list and if then you have to look at some log file uh, which is 
being populated in parallel? How would you uh, read that file? Uh, slash where slash logs where you will get uh, the information about uh, whatever the user have created or done. Mm -hmm. But and if, if log I, file is being populated right now, you want to monitor that log file in real time. So okay. you can't you can't look at the last hundred lines because the last hundred lines will be overwritten very shortly, and then there will be fresh lines added to it. Uh, you want me to monitor a log file? Just a log file. You want to monitor a log file to give, get some errors or something like that. Okay, get some errors. Mm. But the data is usually in the late last written logs, right? Last mm. written 10 or 15 or 100 lines, but the log file is getting populated, like being overwritten every or not overwritten, but frequently updated. Oh, uh, we can use grep command in the log file, whichever uh, we want to look into it. All so right. your voice is breaking. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes. Uh, on the uh, uh, AWS or Azure, uh, what is this public subnet and private subnets? Do you understand what is the di main difference between all these uh, these different yes, subnets? Yes, yes, yes. So public subnets subnets where a user is given, uh, we give all the uh, traffic to that public subnet where user can access. But private subnets, uh, only the private IPs are allowed, not the public IPs via the internet. So for public subnet, uh, we basically don't use NAT gateway. For private subnet, we do use NAT gateway or some other like connecting with other VPC, but not with the public directly in contact. I'm just trying to based on your resume and where you would fit into. Is is there a any sort of scripting experience you have? Uh, can you write some code as well? I've written for uh, Azure, that, like Terraform, like I told, I've uh, done it for Azure case. I'm still learning that. And probably two weeks or three weeks, I'll catch up with Terraform. Not a problem. And can you uh, give me, or I will just maybe, I will find some, uh, some policy and uh, maybe you can help me explain that uh, bucket policy. Okay. So let me send something in the chat box. And see if you can explain this uh, policy. OK, so we are allowing uh, public access to the. Yeah, it's on the screen. Yes, so we are allowing public access to the resource in order to get objects uh, from that specific ER and that specific bucket. What does this star means? Um, OK, so example bucket slash star. Uh, I think any object from that bucket. But then object is resource is this one, right? Yes, so inside that bucket we do now have what is, uh, objects. What is this, what is this star? The, the one on screen uh, principle. Principle star. Oh, sorry, I'm not getting it. Um, yeah, I no. think any object can be picked from the bucket. Yeah, correct. That is correct. I, I just wanted to understand what does this star means? Uh, you got it right. I think maybe you are getting some idea from this line or uh, but I wanted to understand on what is this principal star means? OK, principal star. And what does this action means? Uh, action is where you perform any task. So your uh, your action is to get the object from S3 bucket. So this is the resource where which bucket we have. This is the action. Then what what would this be? This possibly is the user, right? Where who? OK, right. Who is trying to access? No, but the star star means uh, public uh, you can say it's not specified uh, any user or role there okay. okay can you write a bit of terraform code or something you can explain as well uh, or or if any any of the language where you are comfortable with you can write a, some simple use case maybe a hello world in that project okay maybe a docker file and just just keep explaining like uh, what what you are writing and while you are writing oh um well, I just uh, know how it works when I see the code, but right now I'm not able to remember it. Just just a simple, even if it is not correct, like syntax wise okay. or something, I want to understand whether you know conceptually. I, and I believe you are certified, so you would know um, those sort of things. That That's the level I, I need to understand. Or if you want, I can I can pull a Docker uh, file and you can explain. Yes. But it will take me some time. OK, let I have a, a file. Let okay. me uh, share it. Yep. Oops. Is that? Yep. OK, 
So first we're going to pull the base image that is the container base image that will be a uh, node and the latest version as 14 and then set the working directory inside the container. What does this specify? Uh, uh, the version and next uh, we are creating a contain a working directory in a container because uh, uh, Docker file will be uh, of same name, but uh, folder should be different. So we're going to create a folder slash uh, app and then copy the package JSON and package log JSON file to the working directory. OK, so we are copying this package dot JSON to this uh, uh, working directory. That's uh, app and then you're going to install all the dependency using the run command. So run is used. Uh, uh, basically, when you want to uh, install any packages from VM repo, EBT, so that will install the palette packages uh, while uh, building the image. And next, copy the rest of the application code to the working directory. Uh, yes, dot uh, uh, the application code with the extension. If it is a Linux or a, a Windows dot exe, exe uh, if it's a Linux, we have dot var dot jar. So whatever the extension file, we're going to copy it. And then we're going to export the uh, expose the port number. So here the port number is 3000. So we're going to export uh, expose that port number and then CMD expose. Uh, what, what does this mean? Uh, to expose uh, the port number uh, in the sense we're going to expose that application on the specific port number. That's uh, 3000 and then uh, yes, CMD is used to uh, uh, actually uh, to uh, append not append uh, to replace the packages uh, while uh, container is running uh, packages or any statements to the target location. If you want to replace while container is running, we'll use that command um, to start the application. Yes. OK, all right. Some of the comments would have helped. Sorry. Some of the comments in the code would have helped you a, a little bit or you. Uh, you... Uh, no, I know the structure of the Docker file, so it was simple. Cool, cool. All right. Um, so. What area uh, other than that we can I wanted to understand a bit of Jenkins file. Uh, do you understand what the Jenkins file is? Uh, yes, so Jenkins files where uh, uh, I don't have much experience on that. Uh, on Jenkins, I've done all the manual activities. So for Jenkins, we do have a, a declarative and a scripted um, where we're going to specify the um, build a pipeline task like if i take me when we do have six tasks so the task uh, it can be a uh, scripted in jenkins file and uh, then the uh, jobs will be sorry i'm not able to see your video yeah uh, yes uh, yeah so automatically all the task which has been provided uh, which has been specified by the uh, build tool it will be uh, done like for me, when we have some six tasks, code review, compile, unit test, uh, metric check, uh, package to deploy. So all that can be uh, just uh, uh, dumped into into a code and that will perform the job. OK, uh, can you tell some, some experience you earlier mentioned about uh, CloudWatch agent or CloudWatch monitoring? What sort of experience you have? Uh, CloudWatch basically we monitor the metrics of uh, various resources. We I have also uh, set up the alarm like whenever the threshold increases, the alarm has to populate and uh, uh, a user has to get the notification. Notification I worked on SNS. What are Sorry. the out of the box uh, monitoring in CloudWatch and there is also a CloudWatch agent. When do we need agent? A uh, CloudWatch agent I've used for uh, uh, AWS uh, AKS. So we do require CloudWatch agent. Okay. Why, why do we need agent? What's the advantage, disadvantage of an agent? Disadvantage? Advantage and disadvantage like because when I create an EC2 mm -hmm. instance, I do get some some metrics out of the box. I don't need an agent for that. Right. What specific use cases do we need agent for? Uh, CloudWatch agent specific use cases. Um, I do remember that it is for uh, uh, few services we do require a CloudWatch agent but um, not able to renew this, uh, remember the specific use case. Any use case because I don't need agent for CPU and uh, basic stuff like right? just to get the CPU mm -hmm. and RAM kind of thing. Right. Uh, why do I need agent at all then? Uh, 
Right. Um, for specific metrics, which will not be available in CloudWatch that we can populate in CloudWatch agent. For example, any, any example. Uh, pod metrics, uh, like we do have um, uh, pod uh, uh, number of uh, uh, pods in. Uh, have you configured uh, any any um, logs to be sent over CloudWatch? Oh, you mean the log stream? Yeah. Uh, yes, I had uh, configured log stream. So you, you would need an agent configured for that, right? Uh, you mean for uh, um, any, any, EKS? Yes, for EKS or any any application running on your EC2 instance. How do you send the logs from your EC2 instance to CloudWatch? Uh, flow logs to integrate uh, CloudWatch uh, with the flow logs, where we create a log stream for that. Flow logs as in VPC flow logs? VPC flow logs. What are VPC flow logs? Uh, where we get information about the uh, network like the IPs which have uh, been that uh, EC2 instance. You, I think you are mixing up two concepts, right? Like, or, or is it me not asking the right? I want some logs mm. from the EC2 instance, not not the VPC flow data. Logs from EC2 instance. Something, some, some you, you earlier mentioned, like I have a slash war slash log has some, some data. Mm. I want that in CloudWatch logs group. So anyway, the, okay. So you need agent yeah. for such cases. You need agent installed on that uh, EC2 instance, and then that can uh, stream the logs to logs group. But I, I got a good okay. understanding uh, what sort of okay, experience uh, you bring and uh, where you can add a lot of value. Anything you, you want to ask um, before we close the discussion? Mm, as of now, yeah, I'm good with it. Any any last comment you want to make before we close? Uh, yes, I'm too interested in DevOps technology, and that's the reason I'm opting for uh, different options. So here uh, I've got a reason to, uh, I've got a Terraform project where I'll be working on it, but I still want to work on DevOps tools. So I'm very much interested in that. So yes, I'll be happy to work there. Not so. Thank you. All right, then uh, we'll close the discussion and uh, I'll share the feedback. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. From past 4.5 year, uh, years in VVD and technologies. So when I started my journey, so I joined here uh, as a fresher from my college. Uh, I placed here. So I joined here as a uh, intern. So the, at that time I was working in the uh, NOC team. Uh, NOC team uh, stands for like uh, network operations uh, management team. So there we were monitoring uh, the production environments, production servers, these things on various monitoring tools like uh, AppDynamics, CloudWatch, Zebix. So these I have worked on. Then I moved to the CloudOps team. So there my role and roles and responsibilities were to manage the infrastructure on AWS Cloud. So there we were managing uh, the uh, all the AWS servers. There were 1500 plus servers present on the AWS. So we were managing like we were deploying the codes. Uh, if any new deployment came uh, using various deployment methods like blue green or canary similarly like uh, we were doing the patching uh, of the servers to secure our systems uh, like patching more os vulnerabilities business vulnerabilities so at that time i was working with aws then at that time uh, like when we when we were deploying the code so deployment was done using the jenkins uh, jenkins and it was uh, included in that then after one year, I was moved to the uh, DevOps team. So there my roles and responsibilities were to uh, automate uh, our infrastructure, whatever we are, uh, whatever task we are doing on day to day basis manually. So there we were uh, like automating the things using Ansible. Uh, apart from this, we were written Python, Python scripts to automate this. Then uh, recently I was doing the project for disaster recovery. Like if any of the AWS environment or AWS region went down, so how we'll uh, keep our things running in other another region so for that we we are using terraform very impressive uh, profile um, i would say uh, so this is your first company where you are working you said you joined yes. as an intern okay. yes yes and overall how many years of experience you have 4.5 same 4.5 years and you did yeah. your graduation in computer science or which stream it so everything on the resume is uh, you understand that you have prepared i believe yourself yes 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 okay <clears throat> so uh, which uh, which devops tools uh, are you comfortable you mentioned a bit of jenkins then uh, moved to uh, 
a lot of cloud monitoring you mentioned. Yes. Any any Terraform, uh, Terraform Ansible. Uh, apart from this containerization part, I have worked on Docker as well as Kubernetes, but Kubernetes I have done uh, like that, that much on hands on experience I don't have because there is no project in my current company. But uh, for the learning purpose, I did the certification as well for Kubernetes. OK, yeah, I see that you have done uh, three exams as well. Yes, yes. Did you find them difficult? These uh... no, like professional AWS certified solution architect professional was a little bit difficult uh, because it comes with uh, more more with the costing part as well. So that was a little bit difficult. But apart from uh, this, these two, uh, these are okay. Did you use any uh, any dumps or anything? How did you prepare these for these exams? Yeah, so I prepared uh, from Udemy uh, courses. So in my company like they provided us the udemy credentials and the uh, courses so there uh, in the uh, udemy courses itself there are the practice labs so we practiced from those labs and the documentation as well in the uh, you know in the ck certified kubernetes administrator in the exam itself they are uh, like allowing us to open the documentation of the kubernetes yeah so yeah so we we can like easily manage that also uh, before that we did the hands on practice labs to practice for the exam very good stop in this and uh, i want to understand this monitoring part uh, first because you probably have worked extensively on the monitoring side so yes. uh, what is this like give me some idea like why do we need so close monitoring and uh, which kind of monitoring did you work on? Was it something out of the box or were you also involved in log monitoring, etc.? Mm -hmm. OK, so like when we are having 1500, I was telling you that we were managing 1500 plus servers and all were the production servers. So when coming to the production servers, so we have to keep close watch whether uh, all these systems like our, our systems should be up and running and there should not be any downtime. So we should mon man uh, like monitor our servers very closely. So we were using the server level monitoring firstly on the CloudWatch, but CloudWatch has, is having some a, a CloudWatch is a server of AWS, so CloudWatch is having some limitations. Like it is, it is not giving us the memory metrics. Apart from this, if we want to monitor uh, the response time of our uh, of our APIs, like uh, application level monitoring, so that things are also not given by uh, CloudWatch. So on the CloudWatch, we were just monitoring the CPU utilization, disk utilization. Apart from this, if the servers are healthy or not, only these type of monitoring we can do using the CloudWatch. With, with the CloudWatch agent, you can always. Yes, yes, but uh, we we can uh, you monitor the using the CloudWatch agent, but uh, in that case we have to install CloudWatch agent on all the instances. So the that, that was little to... bit. Okay. Yes. How did you overcome this? Uh, so we we went onto this. We looked. We were looking for the solutions. So we found one open source monitoring tool, Zabbix. So on the Zabbix tool, uh, in that case as well, we have to install the Zabbix agent on the servers. Yeah. So, but uh, we were. Uh, but from that as well, we were only getting the memory metrics, but not the API level monitoring. So then we went to uh, this uh, App Dynamics. So on the App Dynamics, we have the clear picture of all the like from where database is connecting to the servers and how this that is clusters are connecting to the servers everything we are we are getting the picture of our so, so what is the difference between these tools do you understand why why uh, these yes. tools are different and uh, yes, like uh, in in the uh, we can say in the metrics level, like we can monitor more uh, infrastructure on these tools. So on the app dynamics, I can say that uh, we can monitor many things. Like uh, we can monitor our database metrics as well on the app dynamics. Apart from this, uh, each and every API which is calling inside inside uh, between application between front end and the back end. Like you can say if we are having one API slash login while logging into the first page, so that. Uh, API level monitoring we can do over the app dynamics. Also, if the response time or if someone is getting the error, so that kind of uh, that level of monitoring we can do using app dynamics. Also, we can uh, integrate many other tools with app dynamics. Let's say pager duty. So to get the calls over the phone, if something went down, so we can get the calls over the over our phones or the emails. So that we have integrated with app dynamics. Apart from this, uh, but one more thing we didn't find in app dynamics that was the uh, uptime monitoring. Uptime monitoring is 
let's suppose we have one site www.insight.netgear.com uh, let's say so for that if we want that this uh, page should be up and running uh, like 24/7 so this type of monitoring we cannot do using app dynamics so for that we were using the pingdom monitoring so what pingdom is doing pingdom is having probe servers at, at different different location in different different countries so from there pingdom is uh, like uh, uh, pushing some uh, we can say load on the on this website URL and in that way it is searching that whether we are getting the correct response code or not. So there we can this type of monitoring we are using the uh, using pingdom also from the pingdom we can use uh, we can uh, monitor transactional monitoring like let's suppose if our site is having working like login page then uh, add to cart button and then check out or the payment method we have in the in our website so we can uh, do that as well on the pingdom like pingdom will click on the login uh, login button then it will check for the credentials then it will uh, like add the products to the cart and it will go for the billing part so it will check everything so we can write a small shell script for the batch script inside the pingdom and uh, pingdom will execute that script after like whatever interval we have set like 30 seconds or the 60 seconds as per our response time of the site so in that way pingdom we are using two, two questions uh, first question is do you understand the difference between these tools why you had to do four or five tools uh yes like uh, when we were implementing one tool so there were some limitations but uh, at the end we have why is that limitation why did aws not implemented what app dynamics has implemented in their tool so now uh, like at, at that time aws was started in i think 2006 uh, or 2007 so at that time i think the resources uh, that much level of uh, you can say expertise was not was not there so i think that time it was not there but now i can say that app uh, this aws is also giving uh, api level monitoring but we have to set some custom metrics and dashboard one one thing that i can add here is that these are different types of tools that you mentioned one is infrastructure yes. monitoring it this yes. app dynamics falls into application performance uh, yes. monitoring. monitoring so yes. that's why aws is not into this to that extent even though you can do log monitoring and all through CloudWatch as well. Right. right. But how did you do, uh, like, how did you enable App Dynamics in your environment? So for that, there are multiple agents for App Dynamics, which is provided by App Dynamics itself. So to uh, monitor the server level uh, metrics like the CPU, memory, disk, whatever the process is running on the servers. So these type of monitoring we can uh, do using the machine agent. So app, this machine agent is provided by App Dynamics only. So we have to install the machine agent on, on our system. Similarly, application monitoring uh, is done by uh, App Dynamics using the app application agent. So there are multiple application agent given by uh, this app dynamics if our application is running on php so it is giving php agent if it is running on java so uh, app dynamics is giving us the java uh, application so we have to integrate it with our system with the right agent yes any any log monitoring uh, experience you have yes and so log monitoring we are uh, using cloudwatch as well as gray log so for the gray log uh, like cloudwatch is uh, we have integrated with our ecs systems which are running on the ecs service dockerized so for that we are using cloudwatch but for the ec2 level like to view everything uh, on the dashboard centralized dashboard so for that we are using gray log so for gray log uh, there is one uh, file uh, there is one log shipper to be present on the system that is file b so we have installed file file b as a service on all our systems and uh, that uh, log monitoring we can do using the gray log. Sure. And how did you install these uh, onto so many uh, 1500 servers? Using Ansible. Can you explain a bit of uh, yes. overview of how your folder structure looks in Ansible? Yes, so uh, there is no access folder structure in Ansible. Like we are using Ansible Tower. That is again a centralized dashboard from where we can run our jobs. So uh, what we did is like uh, we have first we written uh, Ansible job to fetch all the EC2 details, like EC2 details in all the AWS, in AWS accounts so that we can get the IPs of the instances. Because again, we, if we are doing the SSH or if we want to install anything on the server, we need the IP. To how, how, would, how would Ansible get all the instances in an AWS account? Uh, right. So for that, we need to configure the either the roles, IAM roles, like the Ansible server is again present in our one of our AWS account. Right. With that, with that Ansible server, we have the connectivity with all the servers via VPC peering. If 
the uh, if the instances are in different AD, uh, in different VPs or in different AWS accounts. Again, one on the single uh, Ansible server, we have associated the cross account roles present to fetch the EC2 details. That ensures then connectivity use... from your Ansible uh, server, server to all to your other instances. Servers. And right. then you can tell it that uh, these are the IP addresses of, but you, you are saying it, it will do auto discovery, right? Yes, auto discovery. Also, we have to write the playbook as well to fetch the instance level detail. Connectivity is there, but it will not automatically fetch the IPs of the servers. So there is there are some Ansible modules inbuilt on Ansible modules like EC2 info. So AWS we use modules. that module. AWS modules, yes. So using those modules, we can uh, like it will give the output in the JSON JSONs format. So we can fetch those uh, values in our CSV. So we write uh, like the Ansible script to fetch the IP details and the server is in running state or the stop state. These these things we put in the CSV. Then uh, one, one, using one those. Question. Sorry, one question sure. here. So no there is Ansible tower. It will be able to fetch. It's able to connect to those servers. Maybe in one account. How will it know across accounts? No, so cross account. What we are doing, uh, the cross account role is we are just giving the trusted entity, like the account. A trusted entity is a policy which will give the account name, like on which accounts it can trust. So we have to give the account ID of in that policy, like for which uh, servers we have to connect. This policy in which account? This policy is associated with the role which is uh, which is present on the which is uh, associated with the Ansible server. Then we did auto discovery after that. Uh... Yes, so we put the we, we complete EC2 details in the CSV file. Then in the CSV file, we have all the details of EC2 like EC2 name, uh, instance name, instance ID, instance IP, as well as instance uh, what we can say instance state if it is a running state or stop state because on the stop servers we cannot able to access onto the server so we will not be able to install uh, these so after uh, after we get the ip details so we put these ip details in the inventory of the ansible so that ansible can uh, do the ssh one by one and we put uh, like some groups like these are the non prod server ips and these are the prod server ips or if they are project wise so we put the uh, groups like project like this is our uh, project a ips and these are our project this you manually do in the ansible tab yes Yes, there is. A, do you know there's an automated way of connecting this tower and with your inventory file? Yes, there is an automated way, but we have to, again we have to sync those files manually. Like we can put these files on the GitHub, and we can con configure Git in the Ansible tower. And uh, using the sync, uh, there is one option of projects there we can sync our Git with Ansible. So again, but we have to put the file in the GitHub as well manually. So. Uh... You said Ansible. We covered uh, we covered the monitoring part of it. Uh, containerization. I'm I'm sure since you are certified, you you would know, right? Uh, usually the containers are very uh, can be unstable and can be short lived. So mm -hmm. how do we ensure that you know some sort of state that container is maintaining? How do we save some data and all? Okay, so uh, in the containerization part, we are using the ECS, which is again a managed service of AWS. So there we have put the auto scaling on container level as well and the instance level as well. So if the load increases or if the CPU utilization increases, so we have set up the dynamic scaling policies on auto scaling. Like if the CPU utilization, uh, we have put dynamic policy in such a way that if let's say suppose CPU utilization is greater than 70% of, of any of the EC2 instance, so instance automatically should comes up uh, using the auto scaling policy. So uh, like uh, we never face, uh, we never gone into that situation that instance never came up or uh, there is a downtime. So it, 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 also the uh, when we are using the ECS, so there is always an ECS agent, uh, uh, ECS agent automatically uh, running on the each and every instance, which ensures that the container should be up and running. And uh, like let's suppose if ECS went down, so we have configured ECS agent went down, so we have configured ECS agent in such a way that uh, like whenever it went down, so the process automatically start up. Any any state file, any information that container is processing. Uh, where do you suggest it should be kept so that it can be either picked up by the subsequent container if it goes unhealthy? How do we store the state of a container? 
so this is the task definition in the task definition of the ecs we put these uh, these policies like how many tasks should be up and running on an in instance also uh, we can set the memory limits and cpu limits as well that after uh, after one container reaches the limit then another container should come up that again does not explain how where it would store the state of any container oh so, i think it automatically ecs agent automatically monitors this so there must be some some sort of storage where it, it would store right anything around um, volumes do you do you know what, uh, what yeah docker volumes docker volumes you are asking oh, yeah docker volumes yeah yeah what what are docker volumes so in the docker volumes our complete uh, we can say complete uh, details regarding the container uh, is stored or whatever the data we are uh, storing inside that that is being stored over there so uh, but i don't think that we can if the container went down or something like we can associate the docker volume uh, with any other container i don't think we can do so but yeah with the same uh, configuration a new container can come up so uh, so if, if just to correct like if the volume is on uh, efs or some storage where it is persisted the next mm -hmm. container can actually pick it up from there yes either the ebs volume or the efs just going through your uh, profile any uh, gitlab uh, experience no gitlab i don't have not on any uh, uh, you mentioned uh, so mainly you have been managing these servers uh, uh, and and also the application on top of them. Any any DevSecOps kind of experience? Any security experience? Yes. Yeah, so the security purpose, like we have used recently, I uh, configured uh, AWS Network Firewall on our system to manage our egress traffic from the servers. What so, is egress? In, what is egress? Egress is the egress is nothing but our outgoing traffic which is going out from the servers. So that is known as the egress traffic. So we are controlling our egress traffic. Like uh, if we want to, if we want our server to go on, the, uh, like to ping google.com, then only it will ping, otherwise not. So we have restrict our servers to go out, outside. So that we did using AWS Network Firewall and the Suricata rules. What is that? So uh, Suricata rules. So Suricata is, uh, uh, like we can say open source uh, tool which is creating the rules multiple types of rules based on uh, so aws network firewall is uh, like re uh, reading those rules and as per the rules uh, it is restricting our traffic so there are there can be multiple uh, terms in sui kata like pass rules alert rules drop rules so uh, according to the drop rules the traffic will be blocked and if we are creating the pass rules on top of that, if the pass rule is present for uh, the google.com, then only our servers will be able to connect to google.com. And uh, any kind of uh, security product in the application build deployment uh, process? Security product we have used, we are using one CrowdStrike Falcon agents mm -hmm. and uh, one more Tenable uh, agents. Tenable is uh, the product of Nessus. So what Tenable is doing, Tenable is running on all the servers. Uh, again, it is an agent. So what it is doing, it is uh, fetching all the vulnerability details, like uh, for which, like it, let's suppose if Python version is running and it is uh, end of life. So it is detecting and it is giving us the information, like you have to uh, update uh, your patches or if you have to update your Python version, mm -hmm. then uh, our team is doing, uh, like fixing those vulnerabilities as well. Yeah. Uh, and and where is your uh, uh, source code stored? So source code is inside the GitHub only. But uh, those source code repositories we don't have. We DevOps team don't have the access. When we are just giving when, whenever we have to do the deployment. So Dev team uh, application team is giving us uh, the uh, what we can say the GitHub URL that you have to clone this repo and you have to do the deployment. Okay and how do you do the application deployments yeah so application deployments we are uh, like the dev team is again the dev team is giving us the uh, like github url and we are doing it using the jenkins but at the application then this at the infrastructure level we are following blueprint deployment for the uh, servers which are running on ec2 and for the containerization deployment we are uh, using uh, canary deployment we are following canary is, deployment it, is, is jenkins a right tool for doing deployments on to how many how many applications do you have to manage like we have around uh, 10 12, 12 plus applications is, is jenkins right tool for that 
uh actually from the beginning itself uh, it is configured so we are using jenkins as of now how does it do jenkins has the ssh keys to connect to the servers and yes yes ssh keys to connect okay what other options would you suggest because you are anyway uh, so advanced on ansible and you using ansible tower have you guys explored any other option to replace jenkins no actually not till yet not we have not replaced that but uh, like uh, there was a uh, there was a limitation that key uh, key can be like uh, key is not the right option to configure on jenkins but uh, after every 3 months we are rotating the keys using ansible only but uh, like that is a little bit uh, kind of security as well that keys are being rotated but yes jenkins is not uh, that right way we can use bitbucket as well uh, to deploy our codes but as of now again we are using jenkins that is again the management decision do you mind explaining any any production event that you have managed any uh, outage or anything recently that has uh, that has happened uh, production outage actually uh, in the database time uh, in the database end we are using one aria uh, database so that is the third party so we are using that uh, as per the application so there recently what went is like the, Sorry, that aria third party, uh, ARIA, third party third party database yeah that is aria why why do so, we use that uh, actually uh, in the when when it, aws was there when we configured our system in, uh, systems initially so at that time uh, rds was not giving that uh, much capability so that time the project uh, requirement was to explore some new database uh, actually i don't remember the features of aria actually but they are using that uh, third party database which is configured within our systems uh, okay. within our ec2s Okay. So the outage was not with the AWS end. The outage was there with the ARIA end. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we uh, created the replicas at that time. So ARIA went down. Actually, the downtime was only for the five minutes. We tried to uh, like we tried to up our systems. So what we did is like we created some replicas uh, in the ARIA end, and we tried to like whatever the main main data we have we try to install on our rda systems and connect with them but till then the aria was uh, like again up so uh, but we have to we are looking for some solution that we can configure those databases on our systems only because it is uh, like not good that database is outside uh, third party and it can be down for any time so and, and you don't remember why you selected that product no actually when i joined this so the, these projects were already set up now we are doing some modifications optimizations in this infra any any recommendations towards optimization that you suggested uh, over the, all these four, four and a half years yes so recently aws launched the graviton instances which is giving higher performance uh, performance and, uh, and in the cost part it is giving 40% discounts on the uh, old instance types so we moved our all the instances on the graviton instance type so which, which is, instance were you using previously uh, so previously we were using uh, these uh, intel instances okay. so now we are we have moved to uh, the graviton types so which is uh, like 40 percent cheaper than the older similarly smart choice, uh, right? on the ebs that's sorry. a very smart choice right like why would you not want to say 40 percent sorry I, I, I said it's a very smart choice of selecting something cheaper when, you know, yeah. why would someone not want to use Graviton? Uh, so, so I, I'm just... Right. Okay. Okay. No. So Graviton is giving like a same uh, like performance wise, it is very good uh, as per AWS. So performance wise, throughput wise, also uh, like there are some hardware maintenance activities going on on AWS. So for the Graviton instance types, they, these are being automatically managed. These don't we do not have to do anything on that. Apart from this, like uh, yeah, on the cost part, it is cheaper. So uh, we did this recently. Apart from this, like there is one more thing, uh, EPS volume, as you know, that root volume as EPS is associated on all the instances. So previously uh, there was the, we were using the EPS volume GP2, general purpose two. Now AWS launched GP3. So GP3 is uh, very good in throughput and performance wise is also very good. So, and it is then again cheaper than the GP2. So we used, uh, we moved our volumes to GP3. Two questions now from this. Uh, how did you do it uh, moving GP2 to GP3 on so many servers? Again, uh, using Ansible. To Ansible 
Okay, you will update the playbook and. Uh, yes, uh, writing the playbook and in the IM role, we have to give the permissions to update the volumes. And because in the past, we were just fetching the details. So at that time, only read only permissions were required. But now we have to modify something on the AWS Infra, so we have to give you some right permissions. But so this we will give... create issue, right? This you move from GP2 to GP3, there will be an outage. No, no, there was no downtime. We checked first, we tested first on the non-prod environments, and uh, then we moved to the production environment. There is no outage associated. Right, right. And uh, the second question was related to Graviton migration. So how did you research about this, this being a cheaper option and why why not everyone on AWS migrates to Graviton then? Oh, uh, actually, uh, we are having uh, we are using the enterprise uh, uh, AWS infrastructure. Like we have taken the AWS enterprise support. So yes, so we are having uh, weekly calls with AWS management and uh, the AWS Stamps when account manager is associated with uh, our organization. So we have the calls on that. So they recommended us to do so. Then we then we did the research that whether it will uh, like it will not affect on our infrastructure or it will not give us bad impact on our infrastructure so, so we these all these that... recommendations are gp2 to gp3 and graviton is what aws usually recommends to their customer oh uh, yes so but they did want... you have to made any code changes as well for migrating the application no no, no. we didn't did any code changes it migrated straight away yes but uh, when we are changing the instance type so we have to stop we have to stop the systems. Then mm -hmm. only we can change the instance type. Without stopping the instance, we cannot change the instance types. So that time we have to like, like we had to follow some approach that we can uh, do this activity without downtime. Because GP2 to GP3 we can do right away, but to migrate the instance type we have to take some options. So we uh, like. Uh, we what we did uh, we did this activity application wise and we completed this activity around in three months so uh, what we did we created some parallel infrastructure using the existing amis then migrate and if it is non prod so we directly uh, like which do not have that that much impact for those servers so we did directly but uh, for those servers which is having the production impact so those servers we did uh, like using some following some uh, strategies like uh, having the parallel infrastructure up and running then testing on that infrastructure whether it is working fine or not then stop the existing infrastructure and doing the dns cutover so in that way we did it uh, and uh, you are managing or you are part of the discussions with the aws tam yes and and who else um, represents from your company so in our uh, devops team we have 50 people so uh, in 50 people we have four leads so i am one of them so we four leads have to have to be present with uh, the aws stamps apart from this uh, from the client end as well there are two people which are uh, like working with us only mm -hmm. so they are uh, they are also present on that so basically people should be present on those calls and and like these are AWS recommended changes. Any any improvement that you have brought in uh, of late? Yes, yes. So uh, one, two, three services we are using from AWS. Like one is Trusted Advisor and Security Hub. Again, so, time, se time suggested. No, no. These are not time suggested. Uh, okay. These are uh, like we have to enable them. And uh, these uh, services, what these services are doing? These services are uh, like analyzing our our infrastructure and checking what is wrong in our infrastructure and what is right. Like if uh, recently we have many Lambda functions present in our AWS account. So for that, Node.js older version was deprecated. Node.js 12.x is deprecated now. So that security hub and trusted advisor, they are giving us the findings that your Lambda functions are reaching EOL and uh, so similarly like Elastic Cache versions are uh, EOL now. So you have to update these systems. So we did, we are working on those findings as well to increase our security hub scores. Usually AWS recommends that and either the lead or uh, the team lead usually in the organizations look at these reports and have good understanding of uh, what's happening. Uh, yes. But does that mean you are still hands on, you are working or are you just most of these discussions is what you are managing and which is your strongest hands on uh, language or uh, where you can code something? So regarding the code, like I didn't get the chance to uh, on the coding part when I joined, but uh, like I have worked on the Python scripting as well. So on the Python, I can say that I can work on. And 
Terraform Ansible. Yeah, Terraform Ansible, I can write. Can you pull a notepad and share your screen and see if you can write some? Yeah. Just share your screen and that notepad. Uh, see if you can uh, write a Hello World Ansible playbook. Okay. And just just keep explaining what what you are doing so we understand. Uh, sure. So this is the host like uh, where we have to run this playbook. Okay. So currently I'm giving the local host. So it means that it will it can run uh, if the Ansible is installed on our system. So it will be run on our local. So it we can run this playbook on the local system. If we if we have to run this code on any other system, so we can give here uh, like remote location or the inventory file where we have to run where our IPs are placed. So this is used for the uh, code where we have to run this. Now coming to the task, like what task we have to run. Here we have to give the name of the task, like like suppose printing hello world. Let's say we have two servers and we have to run this on two remote servers. Mm -hmm. How would you go about? So so in this we have to uh, give host as uh, our uh, inventory name. And this inventory should be placed somewhere like either in the same uh, path where this uh, Ansible, we are, Ansible script we are keeping. So we have to uh, put in the inventory file we can create uh, if let's suppose this is, is this is my inventory file. So inventory file is having the extension CFG inventory configuration and here we have the groups like let's suppose we have the non prod group. So here we can place our IP. Let's suppose 172.29.something uh, 32. Let's suppose. So and again the same IP. Uh, another IP is three. So and if we have another group broad. That's fine. I, I got the idea. I, I, yeah. I, I so get some idea. Can yeah. we write something in Terraform? Say uh, Terraform plus. So how will you connect your Terraform to your Ansible? Have you done that use case? Terraform with Ansible, no. I like as in Terraform. using using Ansible as a provisioner or mm -hmm. yeah, like, so like Terraform creates an EC2 and then Ansible takes over and deploys some application components. No, no I haven't done this, but Terraform uh, we are using for uh, like provisioning our infrastructure, but not with uh, the Ansible. No, that's fine because you're using Ansible Tower. Maybe that's the maybe I'm just so how can you like can you show us some Terraform experience, how how you maybe to create a bucket. So uh, here we have to give the uh, firstly we have to create the providers.tfa and uh, in the providers.tf we have to give the uh, like which provider we are using like let's suppose AWS we are using. So we have to create first providers.tfa and in this we have to give the uh, actually the keyword I'm not uh, remembering it. So because we are following the uh, Terraform documentation always to uh, check for the providers we can use AWS. Here we have to pass if we are using the AWS credentials, so we have to pass AWS secret key and access keys. Is it a right approach to uh, access key and secret key in the code? No, no, no. This is not the right approach. We can uh, encrypt these as well, but uh, we can if the Terraform if we have the separate Terraform server, so we can again use the roles. I am roles we can use. But if we are how are you running this? So we have the Terraform server from where we are running this and uh, we, we can use like uh, in uh, in my scenario, we are using the Jenkins on top of Terraform. So we have written one Python script uh, which will trigger uh, the Terraform script. So that is the Jenkins machine on our all our uh, this Terraform scripts are present. How will the Terraform script access the AWS secret key and access key. No, so in that case we are not using uh, the secret keys and access keys. Also region we are not managing from here, but uh, we are using the roles. Like role will role role we are create uh, like if we give the permissions in the role that it should create the EC2 instance, then only it will create the EC2 instance. Otherwise not. So who who gets that role? We only created the role. If we require that, the role, uh, but who do you assign it to? No, uh, means I'm not getting. Uh, I, I'm still not sure how you connect your Terraform code to AWS. So the, OK, so this so you have created a role which says say you have administrative permissions, but mm -hmm. how will the Terraform get that role still is a challenge, right? So uh, OK, so this Terraform is running again on the EC2 instance and that EC2 instance is having the role associated which is having the, these many permissions. So this I was the providers. Think, OK, we, we okay. got some idea. Uh, okay. Now maybe some last question like what is your motivation to 
quit this. This is a very nice place, right? You are getting exposure to all the tools, technologies, uh, any specific motivation you see uh, for you to leave. Yeah, so there is uh, like not having any uh, issue with the work related, but uh, having issue with the night shifts. They are now they want now they want us to do the night shifts because some of our customers are US based and uh, they whenever they are like, you know, that their uh, timings are different. So like there are uh, around 12.5 hours difference between our timings. Mm -hmm. So they want us to do the night shifts from the office. But my parents are not allowing me to do the night shifts uh, from office actually and also also i am also having some concerns regarding the night shift but and they are not uh, doing that so that's why i have to look for the change so does that mean you I are mean, not flexible you... if some arrangement has to be required then uh like they are not uh, giving us that uh, flexibility that you can do even if they can give us that you can do work from home uh, but you have to do in the night shift but they are not allowing us so that's why i have to look for that change okay. yeah. You have your own priorities. Yes. No worries. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much I wanted to cover. Uh, do you have any questions? You you would have already received the job description and all. So uh, do you have yes. any questions? Uh, no, uh, I don't have any questions in that. Uh, cool then. Uh, if you don't have questions, close the discussion and I will share the feedback. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good day. Yeah. Hi Rakesh. Uh, Thanks for joining for this discussion today. Um, so this is your interview for the DevOps and uh, cloud engineer role. Um, I will just, you know, share your resume on screen. You just help me go through your resume. Uh, yeah. How many years of experience you have um, mm -hmm. specifically in DevOps and cloud space, and mm -hmm. we will then start the discussion. After. Sure. Let me share your resume. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I'm Rakesh working as a senior software engineer with 2.2 years of experience. So I started my career in AWS Cloud. So my first project was to develop a sub-customer support chatbot. So I developed this chatbot entirely using uh, Amazon native services for uh, Let's. Uh, so for chatbot, I used Let's. So it's a Amazon chatbot service. For Lambda, I used uh, Lambda. I used uh, Code computation. Basically, I used Python for it. Python as a primary language, and SMS to send SMS, OTP validation. I did. After that, API gateway integration with Jira. So we are automatically creating tickets with Jira and uh, getting the ticket details from there and giving it in my chatbot to make it more user friendly for the customers. And for da database, I use the DynamoDB. Uh, after completing this project, uh, I got some recognition on my team. So uh, after that, I was asked to move to the DevOps team. So before that, there there were also some prerequisites to be completed for joining in the DevOps team. So they asked me to complete uh, associate certification, uh, AWS associate certification. So I did uh, developer associate certification. Uh, once after that, I went through the basic concepts of DevOps, like why DevOps is basically used, what what is the reason of using DevOps? And also some networking concepts like IPv4, uh, subnet mask, and uh, some Linux concepts. So while while I'm joining as a DevOps engineer, I, I literally worked as one and a half months or two months as a junior DevOps engineer. Uh, but unfortunately, at the time, uh, the client called off their project due to their uh, financial crisis. So everyone on my team got another opportunity, but I was not given that much opportunity to select the next project. I chose uh, support engineer role. Uh, this is uh, this is not relevant to the DevOps, but uh, I don't have that much option. So uh, I'm working as a support engineer uh, using ServiceNow to resolve the tickets. Uh, Genesis is the technology where I'm working as a support engineer. But when I'm doing the support engineer job, I'm not getting that excitement. So whenever I complete a task, it's a kind of repetitive task I'm daily doing. So uh, I thought to switch back to DevOps. So I'm learning on my own. I'm using the I'm using the data available in the internet and open source to do my DevOps project. Right. Uh, yeah, that's all about myself. All right. Yeah. Uh, even though you don't have much DevOps experience, but your first project, you worked on cloud and uh, cloud yeah. services exposure you have. Yes. And then you uh, have a couple of uh, certifications on your name. So yes. That, yes. That's a good thing. So I'll just stop uh, presenting this. Um, okay.
I want to know a few more details like what is your you said you started gathering information. What's your understanding of DevOps? Uh, what it is? Uh, yeah, uh, why why DevOps is being used? Why so we use DevOps, it? Yeah. Yes, DevOps DevOps is not a technology. So DevOps is a methodology. So it started getting really uh, between around 2015. I said uh, so. So at the time, so there is a huge gap between the developers and the ops team. So whenever the client gives the requirements, developer do the requirement coding and push it into the centralized repository. This code need to be converted as an artifact. The artifact need to be deployed by the ops team. But here we are having so much of difficulties. Whenever the code is not uh, deployed correctly, the ops team might say the there is a problem, there is a fault from the developer team. So there is a huge gap between these two uh, fields, so development team and the operation. So to bridge this gap, DevOps being introduced. So here we are, we are not, we are not doing this process manually. So we are integrating the, we are integrating every service as an automation process through CACD. It's just like a pipeline. So it's like a water pipeline. So when the developer click commit button, everything, everything is automated until it's deployed. So that's what the usage of DevOps. Do you know why they would have started this to bridge the gap you are saying? Yes. Okay. So yes. So the client might give their requirements. Uh, quick. So, you know, the okay. software development life cycle, there is a waterfall model and also we are using agile now. So most of the, most of the projects is based on agile. That so we are using point. that, that, that yeah. was, is something I was looking for to yeah. support the agile projects. Because yes, earlier absolutely. it used to be a lot of waterfall kind of projects. Yeah. So you would have a lot of time to design and build the solution and the mm -hmm. delivery would be probably six months, yeah. sometimes yeah. one year also. Yes. Now we're working in agile mode. We have to deploy the application every two weeks, one week, mm. depending upon the maturity of the customer. So that's where DevOps really comes handy. Yes. DevOps basically help you implement agile uh, in yes. a better way. Uh, uh, also, I wanted to check on your uh, uh, scripting. Uh, you you have mentioned quite a bit of uh, shell scripting. Yeah. And uh, can you give give me a, like what is the difference between these? Uh, scripts. Oh, okay. So uh, I started skull shell scripting after uh, completing the completing the let's work project. The when there there is a prerequisite sites to join as a DevOps engineer, I started scripting. So I used I I get the knowledge of fundamentals of uh, Linux. So in the scripting, I did a small project like uh, I I have a uh, uh, distribution like Ubuntu and also CentOS. So you know the packages are different. So to automate. So to automate the services, to I need to install services basically on this distributions. So I created one bash script. It will find what packages they are using. So what packages basically it is, and it will install the service as per the uh, distribution. Can you give me one example? Can you help me with one? Uh, you you get some error that there is not enough disk space on your uh, server. How okay. would you troubleshoot that issue? How would you know? How much is the storage on uh, that server that you are monitoring? So, oh, okay. I would give, uh, uh, so the command we are asking, right? So I would give uh, yell. So, um, so, uh, okay, forget the command. What would you check? Okay, uh, so, uh, so basically we are having a command to uh, get the CPU details and also memory details. But it's not CPU, it's, it's a storage. Oh, storage, basically a uh, disk storage, right? So it is it is full. We are asking it's full. Uh, yes. How could I resolve that? Right. Uh, I think but how would you know which which volume or which drive uh, is full? First, you need to invest start the investigation. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not getting anything on my mind. Uh, but you will and you will be able to Google that. Give me the command to find the storage and then you can run that command, right? Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> yeah, that's what. That's what I've been doing. So probably I need to get good good grip of commands. Do you know uh, from your certifications and your experience what is CIDR range in uh, cloud? Yes. CIDR. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. CIDR range go hand to hand with subnet mask. So uh, so whenever uh, we are you know uh, I'm taking an example as IPv4. So uh, the devices for naming the devices into inside the network we are using IPv4. So when so. For dividing the network into the subnet, we are using subnet mask. So for the subnet mask, I need to know the range. The first IP is a network IP. There is a range between that. And also the last IP is known as a broadcast IP. For this, I need to really understand the subnet mask. 
so that the subnet mask uh, so for example i'm taking uh, class c private 192.168.0.1 okay 0.0.1 something like that. the first usable ip would be the network ip and the last usable ip would be the broadcast ip as i mentioned between this i might have 254 usable ip so this can be used as a one subnet so if i'm taking another example like uh, 192.168.0.0 uh, so the first part will be the network part second part will be the host part the host part can be converted into the subnets so in this example i might have uh, 256 subnet but uh, for one subnet i would have uh, 256 uh, usable ip so this can be mentioned as a side uh, notation for example this 32 bit right ipv4 uh, for the 255 or 255 255 so when i convert this into the binary i might get sys, uh, 16 24 right so 24 can be mentioned after the internet so if, IP4. If in aws for example or any any other cloud if two such networks have to talk to each other do you know what process we follow uh two uh vpc need to communicate with uh so i would i would use vpc clearing okay uh, for communicating between the two vpc the vpc is basically a virtual private cloud so i need to decide the ingress traffic and egress traffic any here basic requirement for uh, network peering to happen or any best practice around it uh best practice okay for example i'm i'm saying like uh, in the vpc uh, a i'm running one which is for example i'm taking up apache tomcat so i'm having my mysql uh, database on my vpc okay. so for the request which is coming from the vpc a it should be should be related to the uh, this application Apache Tomcat application need to be allowed as an inbound traffic for the VPC B. So, so only allowing the traffic, the mentioned traffic in the VPC B will be the incoming traffic. That would be the best. Cool. That is good. So you will have routes from one subnet or one VPC to the other one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anything in context of CIDR range? Uh, CIDR range. So that's what, if, what... what if both the uh, both the VPC have a CIDR range of 192.168.0.0 uh, slash 24. Then how the traffic would know which VPC to go to? Okay. For this, uh, I would say, um, so one, so we are having. Uh, so basically the good practice is that uh, you should not have overlapping uh, CIDR ranges. So oh, okay. you cannot, you cannot peer them uh, if you have. Uh, huh. exactly same or overlapping ip addresses because then your uh, traffic would not know which okay. uh, vpc it has to target okay. no worries should not be overlapped okay huh. yes it shouldn't be overlapped that's yeah. a very basic okay. Right. Okay. okay can you tell me a bit about uh, dns records you have mentioned uh, route 53 and other uh, services in your resume uh, yes so what was your role in that uh, yeah sure so DNS, I have used uh, DNS over one of my project. So DNS is basically domain naming system. So, so it's, a, it's a like a telephone directory when I give the URL. So when uh, it, it basically convert it into the uh, IP, so corresponding IP. Mm -hmm. So I got uh, DNS from GoDaddy. So I used it my it in my Route 53. So whenever uh, whenever the user ping the, the this domain name, so it automatically gets the IP from the Route 53 and it will use to uh, forward this request to the Tomcat server. So it's, my, it's basically my web application. That's, that's, that's a load balancer. Uh, what is load balancer? The load balancer I have used in engine it's for load balancer. What is the difference between load balancer forwarding a request and DNS forwarding a request to an IP? Uh, okay, load balancer will usually split the traffic with my instances. Uh, so in the domain name thing system, DNS, uh, so it it so I'm not sure. So it basically forward the traffic right out so, know, of fifty usage of route fifty three. So so they they look very similar, right? They both of them yes. seems like yeah. routing the traffic, but yes. there, there there must be a difference. No worries. Uh, I want you to know what what sort of experience you have in the DevOps space, like Jenkins or uh, Bamboo, Bitbucket. Uh, so yes. if you can explain a little bit in that area. Sure, sure. So Jenkins, I have used Jenkins for the complete CI/CD automation. Uh, so this pipeline 
uh, I have used uh, Git as a Git repository, and uh, uh, from there, whenever I used web boots, so whenever the code commits happen, it will trigger the build. So I used, I, I'm using Java application, so I'm using Maven as my build tool. So I'm creating artifacts from there, and the artifacts go into the unit testing. And uh, you know, after the unit testing, I will, I'm also using the Sonar Cube for checking the vulnerabilities. Uh, once after that, uh, after can you, can you tell I'm, me a bit bit about the Sonar Cube interface? What, what do you see in the Sonar Cube? Yeah, Sonar Cube is a kind of graphical interface where I can see my bugs and also the vulnerable vulnerabilities the code has. And I'm all, I can also set the gateway. So if the code having this much of bugs, it should not uh, cross the pipeline. It should fail okay. at that pace. So I'm also used custom gateway for this. Uh, if everything is good, the core, the artifact will be converted. I need to store the artifact with versioning. So after storing it on my ECR, the artifacts will be deployed in the ECS. So through ECS, I, I, I would get that. Are you using private repository, a private ECR, your, your own managed? Yes, yes. My AWS account, private ECR. Is ECR a regional service or uh, uh, is it a region specific or global service? Uh, it's a it's a regional service, a regional service because uh, I'm not, I'm a bit confused. I'm not sure whether it's a regional or a global okay. service. You have mentioned a bit of Ansible and Terraform. So was it in the same project you were using both these tools? Uh -huh. No, it's it's a different project. Uh, yeah. So have you written Ansible and Terraform code yourself? Yes. Yes. Is it so possible Ansible... if you can write some Ansible script uh, and just explain on the Notepad now? It could be a hello world. That's fine. OK, so uh, I'm sharing my screen. Let me open a notepad. Sharing button. OK, I'm sharing my screen. So Ansible, so I'm I'm writing a very basic Ansible uh, playbook. So here I'm giving the name. So our name can be something like hello world. I'm starting my script here. So post uh, any. So here I usually mention inventory file. So the inventory file basically have the details of my target. Now I'm starting the task. Can there be more than one targets in the inventory file? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I can have uh, a huge range of uh, targets. So that's what uh, basically Ansible is being used. So we can target uh, as many number of servers and we can just, with a single playbook, we can do the whatever we want on the servers. That's why so I think he, this is good the way you are explaining. Specifically, you didn't start writing just by yourself, like you are explaining as well in parallel, which is. Yeah. Is, you also worked on Beanstalk? Yes. Yes, I did. Can so, you explain what was the use case? And, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. So in my AWS CACD project, I used Beanstalk. So uh, before that, uh, I was using my background, uh, so background to host. Uh, Any website. reason why you selected Beanstalk? Is, was it your decision or your company, some architect uh, finalized it for you? No, so it's it's the so I explored in the internet. So this is basically uh, so for the website web application. So we are using Beanstack. So it's a it's it's very easy. So it, it's completely automated. The EC2 servers, so the or the load balancer or the ASG group, everything is created for you. Okay. You just need to allow the security groups with your uh, other services. Then it will start working. So that, that, that's the reason. You want it to it to be very simplified for. Uh, developers yeah, for they just work on the source code and load balancer server creation auto scaling is automatically managed yes yes what are roles in uh, aws okay so basically iam roles can be used to queue for the user and for the groups and also for the services for example if my lambda need to speak with uh, i need to give the s3 role for the lambda servers it goes with groups as well as users so whoever have the roles they will be able to access the services. So it's basically allowing AWS services access to other services. Yes. How long was this uh, chatbot, uh, this Lexbot project that you were working on? Uh, I was working about uh, four to five months on that project. So I was the only person working on that. So I usually, uh, I used to connect with my managers uh, on weekly basis. Mm -hmm. So they will give the next task to be completed. So that's how the let's board. Which other areas you connected this uh, chatbot to? Like there is a Lambda function in this yeah. using Python. Yeah. What other systems was it talking to? To some database um, yes. as well? Yes, 
uh, so uh, it it the flow starts with uh, so it's it's a uh, I basically mentioned like uh, customer support chatbot. Mm -hmm. So usually the customer will raise ticket on their website, the client client's website. So they want a separate chatbot to make this process more simplified. So they want us to make a chatbot where they will just give the uh, their problem. It need to be created as a ticket and the ticket number need to be displayed for the user. The user, user can uh, use the ticket number and query it so this function gets it. So for that, uh, the first of all, user need to have uh, the, uh, so the user need to have the account uh, over here. So I need to validate that. For that, I given those, those details in my database, DynamoDB. So whenever the user enters their phone number, it checks that DynamoDB. If there is a number, it will send the OTP to them and it will validate their connection. Okay. Why, why, why DynamoDB? Is it, is it user? Because you were working on it, right? So only you yeah. selected it or some someone helped uh, you? I selected it. Uh, Any reason why you selected DynamoDB for this and not RDS or some other cluster? Or... Yes. Okay. I feel like DynamoDB is uh, way more powerful. So it's, it's serverless and they are having the huge set of data. Uh, uh, so for that, DynamoDB is using key value pass. It's having low latency. So probably I thought this would be the thing to show. So they just want, they just how want- How do you upload to... data to DynamoDB? Like say, how do you, how were you populating the DynamoDB? Uh, so I was not given that huge data. So I, I'm, I'm, I have given my own data for the testing. So they just want to have the prototype after that, they said they will give the main project. So I was basically building my prototype. Okay. So it wasn't a real project then? Uh, yes. So usually we have a discussion with clients. So so they, they will say the development. So then the next thing need to be developed. So once after the completion of the prototype, so they said uh, they will give the project and the allocation of the project details. Everything. But in, 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 you know, right in uh, SQL Server or in yeah. any um, RDS, I can write some insert queries. I don't know yeah. how to how to do that in DynamoDB. Oh, how do you oh. push data to DynamoDB? Mm, okay, uh, I didn't use uh, this so this kind. Do you not yeah. face any issue pushing that data because if you have hundreds and hundreds of records, yeah. how would you push that data to DynamoDB? You would have probably used the console and would have yeah, entered that data. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I have basically given my data. So it's it's around twenty to thirty set of rows. Yeah. So that's that's all. Let you explore that option. How how you can push data to DynamoDB? Sure. Let's talk about a bit of uh, Kubernetes now. Uh, you have quite a bit of experience with Kubernetes as well. So yes. what was the use case? Because it's not fitting into this project. Yeah. Uh, so I so I just want to explore Kubernetes on my own. Uh, so basically, I learned Docker. So what is <laughs> what is the usage of Docker? So for uh, so to maintain the Docker's, for example, if one Docker goes down. So there, there is need to be high availability in Docker as well. So that's what we are using management service like orchestration service like Kubernetes. And also there is other services like EKS and other services. But Kubernetes is being uh, famous. So I learned uh, some of the basic concept, concepts of Kubernetes. Yeah. I understood the architecture and how it is being used. And also I used uh, some basic things on Kubernetes like Minikube. So I installed Minikube. So it's uh, just one node uh, Kubernetes. I did that. But it's not used for in any project as such, more for uh, self-learning. Yes, okay. not, not implemented in the project. But you still uh, talk a lot of uh, architectural terms uh, there. So it, it's good you have learned uh, quite a bit of it, it seems. Uh, have you have you used, uh, uh, how do you deploy to a cluster? Uh, okay, deploy. So I need to deploy. So you have built your container images now, how in, they are in ECR. How do you push them to cluster and have you used any automation there or kubectl or how do you push that? The, yes, so so I did remember, so I basically follow the instruction from the open sources so from the website. So, but I do remember uh, a command like, so I created uh, I created once one command on S3. So whenever I, um, whenever I ping that command, it automatically, automatically clear, creates the, uh, the Kubernetes. So from there, I think I have done I have done the container running over there. So in the under the pods, it's a kind of fake. So so you didn't do any um, CI CD on Kubernetes through some commands. You you believe it was deployed? Yeah, yeah, not 
not in the uh, but what what is your understanding of microservices framework why do we use kubernetes in elastic beanstalk that was doing the job right yeah so why do we need to complicate life and use this yeah so uh, we are using container service so uh, basically the containers are being used because uh, uh, so to to isolate and also give the high availability with a low cost because capital expenditure operational expenditure we are using containers for the containers uh, to maintain the containers we we absolutely need kubernetes the kubernetes can handle not only the docker containers for every container so that's what we are having pods under the pods uh, uh, we can use the containers so, uh, so that's that's the real usage of kubernetes but what uh, problem does this solve it's just just the management of containers yes uh, so it manages containers and also it provides high availability and uh, what is high availability how how does it provide ha yeah okay so uh, whenever uh, for example i'm running one service on only one server so if the server went down the service will not be working so in that case i need to be having two or more services two server to host the services mm -hmm. so that's that's called high availability okay. so if even if one server went down i will be having two other server to host uh, the again that that can be solved by elastic uh, beanstalk using auto scaling group in two different regions or two different uh, AZs, then that can be solved, right? Uh, but the Elastic Beanstack will not be able to handle the containers. Okay. That's what, that's what so it is. It's more of a container management, that's why. But what, what other benefits does, does microservices offer? Uh, microservices, my, uh, so, uh, the, it gives, a, so as I mentioned, the capital expenditure or operational expenditure is comparatively low. Why? In the, you are in the microservices. You want Kubernetes to manage the environment, then maybe to monitor the Kubernetes, you would need additional monitoring tools. So you are adding operational cost and operational effort to, to it. Yeah. Isn't so it? I, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just comparing the VMs with the Kubernetes. So that's what I'm going around this point. Uh, so you are asking about... Uh, what are the two benefits of microservices? Oh, okay. So I would say the services are uh, in the very small... It's, it's very small services. So after combining the so one process every process combined we get we get the last result or so last uh, service so, so that's a major benefit so even if one service one microservice get affected we can use other services to get the application right. that would be there so if so basically two benefits would be probably which i would articulate would be that you can scale these services individually if you believe yeah. that uh, one of your dashboard is going to be viewed more than any other service and dashboard okay. takes a lot of uh, resources and you yeah. want to scale specifically a service which presents the dashboards then you can scale that automatically second benefit would be that if you just have to change the dashboard screen and nothing else has to be changed you can deploy just the dashboard related uh, microservice mm. so okay. it gives sort of isolation and yeah. then scalability that's required okay. per uh, service. I think that's pretty much, uh, Rakesh, I wanted to yeah. check. Um, you did a very good job, actually. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I could Sorry. feel that in some of the questions, uh, some of some of the time you go beyond uh, one or two year um, DevOps engineer, yeah. you, you, your language comes out uh, yeah. that of a senior. And um, although the project uh, chatbot kind of project are very small in nature. Yes. Yeah. I think I have myself built or I have seen people building chatbot in a hackathon, which is a weekend activity. Yeah. Uh, and they will they will integrate with say WhatsApp or Twitter yeah. and all that will send notification to external systems. So it can be very basic structure can be done in, in a very short amount of time. But obviously, yeah. if customers have to use it, then you would have a yeah. bit of testing, make it robust so it integrates with their system. So I, I could see that you have good experience on a lot of uh, cloud services and DevOps. Any question uh, that you have, uh, Rakesh, before we close? Uh, so I would ask, so I'm just started exploring DevOps. So what what can be the areas I need to concentrate? Okay, we'll discuss it uh, offline. We'll close the uh, interview sure. and then yeah. we'll uh, discuss it. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll just get to your resume. Uh, uh, resume here uh, so we can uh, go through this a bit about your experience what what your course core skills are and we can uh, 
take it from there. Yeah. Just intro about myself. So my name is Dabashi Singh. I've been close to the nine years of experience till date. Dabashi, there total. is a bit of background uh, noise that I hear. Is it? Uh, I am at. Yeah, someone's play. Everybody is working from home. Okay. For reason. Uh, okay. Then allow. Yeah, give me two minutes. Let me go to another place. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, engineer, uh, yeah. Okay. So basically, I'm having total close to nine years of as of now, till where I started my career as a software engineer trainee, working on PHP uh, technology, mostly yeah, developing websites using PHP as the backend language. And uh, yeah, going forward, I upgraded my added uh, frontend skill like HTML5. CSS3, JavaScript, Query, Angular, React. So basically, I was a full stack developer initially for uh, for the initial phase, that is three years. And after that, I put myself into cloud computing. Uh, and coming to cloud, I got opportunity to undergo training and certificate as your and IBM Bloom. But yeah, I got an opportunity only to work on on AWS platform as mm -hmm. an application engineer or cloud engineer. Mostly engage in the migration activities, and during the stay, during the cloud journey, I got an opportunity for a, for a project where the DevOps practice was sort of implemented. From there starts my DevOps journey, and till date, I am as a core DevOps engineer. Coming to DevOps, uh, initially started with uh, the tool stack, tech stack as sort. Bitbucket, Jenkins, GitLab, and Docker Kubernetes started mm -hmm. with self scripting, but they moved to Python thing. And uh, since last two plus years, as uh, I associated with banks, so I got exposure to the security part also. So hence, as of now, I'm working as a DevOps engineer, you can say. Okay. So yeah, I'm profile currently working for uh, HDFC Bank as DevSecOps engineer. And the roles and responsibilities in, include mostly yeah, similar to a DevOps engineer, mm -hmm. apart from uh, considering the security practice DevOps platform. So, okay, quick question. Um, I got a good good idea about your profile. Uh, how about this sort of transition like from uh, standard charter to HDFC? Uh, so usually uh, the Indian banks that uh, digital uh, presence or uh, you know you can say not so well for fast paced kind of uh, banks so and 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 also the salary part like was hdfc able to salary and all other uh, stuff uh, yeah see this uh, yeah this is another story when mm -hmm. i uh, opted or when i decided to move from S so I had the yeah, multiple offers like um, not from India. I had offers from abroad also, and I planned or one for which I I moved out of SCB was <laughs> to go abroad. But at the last stage, you know, due to family issues, constant and all, I could not yeah, make it. Although I had everything with me, the visa also started, but I have to end it. And okay. at that point of time, I got an uh, offer from SGFC and uh, the tech stack uh, that we were talking about, Indian Bank. I was well aware of Indian banks don't have that tech stack. But in SGFC, these people, they just had uh, started two new verticals, that is Digital and Enterprise Registry, on, on July 21. It had been around eight or ten months when I was interviewed uh, after the formation of their, their two verticals. The tech stack, the need skills were very good, and the people or leaders who were hired to drive this, they basically come from uh, actually consulting a startup background. Okay. So think that or uh, assuming that that uh, I will have constant uh, in tech or anything, like in banks, so restrictions and the legacy technologies. So thinking that only, I joined SDFC, uh, and yeah, the decision was correct. And the salary part was taken care. Yeah, salary they gave uh, a good salary, like good hike they gave. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, we will get into the discussion. So, 
brief like basic question what, what's your understanding of then explain we can take it from uh, okay it's not a technology or it's not a tech like rather it's a mission mm-hmm. and coming to multiple organization it is not specific to uh, any category maybe bank or maybe commerce but yeah devsecops should be imposed or should be enforced to each and every organization irrespective of the domain there are multiple benefits out of integration of devsecops which leads to a formation of a security layer over your organization structure the second one having a security gate where the chances of possibilities are there when the major part of any organization is the data is compromised by various means so that can be prevented by devsecops commons agility and obviously the con again the security of the whole infrastructure so so what uh, in in this whole phenomenon and how okay sec up significant time uh, the brain uh geo separation ideally the bridge between upper and operation by devops and and security coming uh, to add I... okay so any any specific tools uh, that you have used to uh, enable the security so with god grace i can say i got an who i am working as of now he gave me driving um, a tool named marks which is used to scan the vulnerabilities mm-hmm. so from the point of view for our vertical i am single point of contact we are collaborating working that having this check marks started all premise and now we have moved to a cloud saas model and um, the scan types include your, your sca and now we have included kicks also which uh, secure your infrastructure maybe docker file maybe kubernetes or terraform anything mm-hmm. or your manifest files so apart from that we are using sonar cube and for sonar cube also um, i am I, i may not say the single point of contact but i am the single point of failure for sonar but for checkmax i am single contact as, as of now we haven't any point of failure yet Okay. Yeah, those two. Yeah, two tools we are using as of now. So, did you check marks uh, with some other product? How was this decision made? No. Uh, when I joined two months ago, the decision was made to be onboarded. I mean, already it was being onboarded to bank, but mm-hmm. to our vertical, it was me who who onboarded. Uh-huh. Ideally, our uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, ideally our responsibilities was that uh, we as a DevSecOps engineer, we should only help to integrate those tools in our pipeline. That was the responsibility. But mm-hmm. as it was an open play, there was no restriction, and I took uh, responsibilities and and drive it or I drove it. Okay. Uh, any specific uh, benefits that have come? Th- you can quantify uh, using check marks. See, basically, it is should have come into picture for making the decision of onboarding into bank. But uh, coming to your question, what has been the benefit of using this? As user point of view, I can say it's pretty, uh, say straightforward, and the flexibility they can the integration the integration was yeah little complex or ha, had a twist. But yeah, consuming those the view. It's pretty yeah, straightforward, and they can generate the re- based on uh, the can take ahead with their release process or with the process of DevOps. But what what is the benefit you have got after integrating this tool? The benefit is that we we have a because we we haven't integrated over the pipeline. Apart from that, we have also integrated in the IDE plugin of that. A developer who is developing uh, uh, any app or any website with stack and Sorry, are integrated. you saying you have not integrated any yet no no pipeline also integrated and okay. we have also ID integrated also. in the id also okay got it okay. yeah so there will be yeah sanitization done first is from the id level like bank environment or, or not in the in the devsecops environment the developer environment and when they are pushing to the pipeline takes care because in our pipeline is already integrated what are the benefits you have received so far with this uh benefits we have received we have uh, available free of uh, applications so 
so that's the primary thing of uh, what kind of issues uh, has this reported do you remember any specific or any any of issues that it reports uh, see, uh, see there are multiple scan categories uh, uh, under check marks uh, SAS, which is source code application then uh, hca source composition analysis and so multiple features uh, multiple vulnerabilities comes under different category. For mm -hmm. SAST, it is pre-built like analyzer application category. For coming into HCA, when application is built, you need few dependencies, libraries or few third-party libraries which helps in building your application. So that comes under source code uh, means analysis. So, okay, source composition uh, so analysis. Third one is the kicks, which points to a repository. In, in our bank, we have a single pointed repository or a standard repository where our Helm charts dot resides. So that is taken care by kicks. So the main advantage of we are sanitizing the application completely. We are finding the vulnerabilities. We are vulnerabilities at a very granular stage. Give me one or two example of these vulnerabilities. Um, see, it depends again. Uh, Okay, I can say as of now, recently I I got one uh, from a specific. Um, it was from a Docker file. While scanning the Docker file via Kicks, so it had multiple or three multiple errors. The first, um, uh, those people of they haven't met the standard of creating the Docker file. Like in bank, we created a standard of creating a Docker file. So there are numerous points. Yeah, starting from the size, uh, a standard or basic image. So these are all the few points which we have set creating a Docker file or a Docker image. So it's such. So that's very we, basic, right? Standard not uh, false. Uh, Even looking at with not, your eye, code review can get those issues. Okay, but then a, a manual approach, right? So what is that is, SCA? What is the tool? Check marks has research vulnerabilities. Typically, you must be scanning applications or your mm -hmm. web applications, Docker file. Like what happens in, in our, our environment, if we get some specific issue, we get like 10 or 20 things that issue. Like this issue is at line field in this file, then another file, another. anything that comes to your mind that this tool helps with. Yeah. So previously, uh, I got uh, one report through one report. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, one developer, they have the credentials. The credential, I guess, I could not remember. It was, I guess, DB name or some credentials. I am not sure for which, but okay. they have, yeah, integrated the username and password, including the token number. So okay. that was highlighted on the second or third point. Again, like okay. even a basic code review would have revealed that. Again, not something. Yes, tool helps, but uh, you exactly. I do understand your point. Uh, that everything can with the naked eyes you can't easily detect, or tool would probably be a better in um, in the. There are ten categories. Uh, these guys follow. See inside check marks, they have the. Uh, I cannot, so okay. that can uh, the check marks have or they are. So if you if you say follow this standard, they would bring those rules. And rules are already predefined for our, our organization. Right. So when the scan initiate, uh, it makes sure that the vulnerabilities which are being thrown out are being aligned with those standard or policies. Right. If not, then obviously it will it will report it. Okay, so that, what is any any idea what what those? I haven't bi-hatted it to be honest. Okay, so what happens uh, when you receive an issue, your pipeline reports, or uh, wh wh what's the workflow? Okay, so before conclude, yeah, let me give you a short uh, background. We team here like a governor is G. From our DevSecOps point of view, our work on integrating the report, post that the developer team needs to take this report and have a clearance from me. This is the workflow and coming to uh, the technology end, we have integrated not only to only initiate the scan, we have customized the logic in such a way that 
that once the pipeline finishes, we have just said two more ad hoc. Just had released last week only. Uh, like we have said the mm-hmm. for SASH and HCA as of kicks is not yet being integrated. Uh, for SASH and HCA, I have said the quality threshold go uh, yeah, based on the IG discussion. So assume I have set a five or ten number of vulnerabilities to be passed for my dev environment or for my node. So if it breaches ten or five, the pipeline will abort, or change will abort, and it will abort the pipeline also. Got it. But yeah, but the report will be shared to specific number of email to specific number of email users which are being drafted or which are being part of our dot env file. We we have completely sort parameters, and here we follow the shared structure. We have entries over a pipeline for thing of shared list, so that as a user, if you consume, directly invoke the function on your Jenkins file, and if you are good to consume our scan. Okay. So, some more details as to uh, anything highly available applications. How do you ensure one application is available? And yeah, some something around that. Uh, well, that was yeah. That comes in our bucket here in okay. current organization. Okay. The reason being, it's a very big organization, and we have a separate clouds of clouds vertical for it. Okay. So we are a centralized dev sector. Okay. Who's who's mostly responsible create work or platform that can be consumed after it integrate their application. Uh, will be architected. Your team will not be involved in from intra point mm-hmm. view also. No. No, as of okay. now, no. Your profile says you have used Terraform and Civil. So does that fall into your responsibilities? Uh, currently, I have used recently Terraform, but we architected it. Rather, we have created few modules for one of the projects at at a very initial stage, like last coming to our team into DevSecOps. They have their own infra guy who created the module. Make sure that they follow the standardization which we have set. Like we have our own repository structure, and they need to push their code into it. Like in sort of bank, they sourced everything the tech part, and now we are building in-house community. Are you certified? You said you are certified on few stuff. Ah, uh, past I did for US Developer Associate. As of now, planning for Kubernetes, CKD. Mostly by next month, I will be doing that. Okay, all right. Ah. Uh... Do you understand um, the cloud well architect framework? Yeah, in past organization, I I got exposure to this. So, can you explain like what what is what do you mean by that? Um, cloud architecture it depends like uh, like can you be yeah, more specific which type of design or how? Like there is a term actually well architected framework. So. What are those pillars of well architecture uh, that you usually follow? And see, mostly what I have came across is three-tier application, mm-hmm. after application network, clean layer, and your database layer. So three-tier architecture, what I have heard and what I have came across till date in my developer and both DevOps journey. Okay. Okay. Can you explain what is three-tier architecture? Ah, uh, three-tier. I. Architecture combines your application layer, your network layer. Your application layer comprises of code which are required uh, to build your application. Network layer is, is signifies the part or cake which allows you have a connection between, I can say, a source and destination or between two layers. The database layer, which is most significant, comprises of all your the exact keyword for is this. All your sensitive information data, okay, to mm-hmm. be stored at a place, you can term that as a database. Picture um, layer. These are for application for infrastructure. Sorry. So you said this this is a three tier architecture. This is an application. Yeah, for any application or uh, I can first we ask what is. So your I code. Mean. Code is. Uh, Layer followed by networking and followed by secrets. Um, uh, this three should be the coming yeah, the category of R. There is one more layer which is called as the user interactive. Uh, I forgot so that four tier architecture. 
it's a three layer first is the user interactive layer one is the application layer uh, which comprises of uh, this networking and that as a subcategory and i guess the network layer i i could call as of now yeah this two i can recall that is the user interactive layer application layer okay do you public subnets yeah in cloud as well. what is the difference so between these two major difference See, not that this is public this is private no no uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the one thing which is a distinguish is a uh, subnet is used which can be accessed globally from any restrictions right yeah uh, from a tech point of view if i want to store my file with the public because that like my data will be compromised or that is that is not the key difference that is the reason to have us a... i guess this is the basic uh, or the main reason why you should have public or uh... right main reasons to have but what is the key difference public subnet and the private subnet so my experience anything from it... routes point of view in the uh, it is two way accessible but in private it is is one way like uh, a unidirectional and bidirectional i can say hmm okay all right uh, have you performed any disaster recovery in your environment uh, by choice or to be honest current didn't i could not because past was also a bank so we did only poc but because by that time i Left over. You are you are mainly on AWS, right? Ah, uh, we are not any cloud specific. Okay. AWS and GCP, including Azure, so not any cloud specific. Okay. Have you ever uh, engaged into cost optimization activity? Last quarter, I was engaged on the cost optimization, but it was related in Slave Agent. not for any project or not for any where uh, the jenkins agent which we used or which we are using as of now for our vertical how we are do and how can we threading in various parameters that was a poc only so uh, our recommendation was because currently it was on premise so station uh, so so those were research and yeah, those one tested with proper just because like for the developer even we jenkins platform we face this lot it takes a time delay to execute the pipeline all of everything on our jenkins file but still it takes a lot of time so those are few things uh, parameters based on which we went ahead with the cost optimization any any difference uh, between three different types of load balancers uh, is uh, aws i can say what i remember uh, classic Application balancer and network load balancer. Mm -hmm. Mostly we uh, came across balancer. Uh, see, application load balancer I have used or I have been uh, in touch with uh, in my past uh, experience. So application load balancer picture or has its benefits of a FPS routing. Previously, uh, before coming into the bank domain, I was part of a startup. It was more of platform. So we had multiple modules or microservices. for our website so there we have, we were using uh, so that we can configure or we can route based on the module part the result enhances uh, the traffic handling i can say so that's uh, the benefit that's the benefit of using l the performance and handles the tra yeah, traffic yeah, based on the user request but and he also supports path based that's not the major difference between these two um as of now i can recall this and i, I can mm -hmm. okay in your environment how it's as of now we are handling the secret engine vault uh, since we are uh, creating jenkins keys we are not the right uh, team or yeah we are not the right team who are taking the ownership of the jenkins too rather we have a support the vertical to mm -hmm. take up uh, the ownership of these tools like git and jenkins or sonar queue we only consume their services so we recommend to have a key store to store the credentials over 
and for this Kubernetes. Have you designed any solution? System design? Uh, system design, not individually end to end, but rather part of the system design. Anything you recall, you anything you, you have been part of was designed recently? But recently not, but past. Yeah, during the initial phase of my current organization and on my previous organization, previous organization on the mid, uh, I was part of the end to end. Uh, it was a migration project from us to cloud with integration of the DevSecOps. So yeah, there how, how I was the approach for the migration and what was your role in that? Uh, my role DevOps point of view because we had already a good architecture to gave uh, architecture the legacy architecture into cloud with the various uh, so we are the point of view end user to consume our DevOps platform. So me as a DevOps engineer created a framework which will uh, pick or which will consume or fetch the application from their source code repository, scanning those, creating a build, dockerizing, pushing into for Docker image scanning, post that, deploying into a specific namespace. This was an end-to-end -end framework created by me and my two team members in my past organization. Were you involved in any um, discovery of resources on-prem or was it? Just... I uh, no, I'm part of automation. Okay. I think that is pretty much I wanted to discuss. Uh, do you have? Any... Uh, yeah, I have few. If you allow me. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so just want to check as I am already being conveyed by the person who has to use the major job. Yeah, pass this uh, form for us to connect. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to ask about what exactly because uh, the capital one is also and so what all? How can I differentiate between uh, what tech, what environment I, I'm working as of now and what environment is there set up for your organization with respect to tools, technology, everything? So I think we have uh, tried giving as much as possible on description as well. We are uh, um, what other tech stack, synchronization, Kubernetes, Graform, uh, Ansible. Pretty much you probably been working on as a DevOps engineer have some understanding. Yeah. Uh, so the tech stack is uh, play test. We try to get senior engineer. Um, Devineers to provide feedback and uh, make changes. So we need we need that kind of uh, profile as well. Okay. So. The, uh, uh, work location or in Bangalore, do you have or it's specific to any uh, state? We uh, open. Uh, we have uh, people uh, coming uh, work location. We have uh, office and they do join uh, office on. Uh, Weekly uh, major when it's required. But okay. as of now, we are uh, into that mixed mode. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if they are remote, they from home, they are uh, we are visible on that. Will you provide remote work options also? Yes, at, at least it's open. Right now, there is no restriction. Okay. So it's not permanent, but yeah. I because it's a Bangalore and in Bangalore may know where is the location of uh, like your place. Your... Capital One has uh, offices. Um, we have offices in Electronic City and um, in near the airport as well. You have one near the airport and then one? Electricity. Electronic City. Okay, perfect. Uh, yep. With respect to the security tool, will it be fine if you can uh, uh, share uh, which tech, which many security tools we can use or consume by your DevOps platform? Yeah, yeah we use multi uh, tools, not restricted to any specific tool. That's why most of my questions are not about tool as such. They all have, uh, what we have found is they share similar sort of reports. So, so 
in but as it was onboarded and the, and you know was working in bank environment work with senior stakeholders who are quite senior and experienced and they have a long tenure in bank they don't go directly for the change or they don't adopt the change at a fast pace as we do in it organization so that's the reason that the that's a fact uh, we have an other tool rather we have done few spotify also and for one other tool it was white switching or something i those two were done and we took it ahead with the senior stakeholders but that didn't work the lady onboarded and the governance team or the finance team they they directly they counter or directly said at us this tool is already we have onboarded and if we are going to onboard a new person with okay. the multi check marks has advantage that it has an self host as well any hosted right. or it was hosted in a bank version and now recently we have one check marks one which is a saas model we yeah, they have instance of aws and pointed to or a single integrated to hdfc it's not a restriction over here we try to you look at uh, capital one history developing in house uh, softwares and them open source Sure, you look at high by capital source made made it uh, open source. It's a dashboard okay. that connects to different DevOps tools and give okay. you a very holistic uh, view of the environment. That's an open source project now. So yeah, so we have a bunch of house tools, uh, multiple tools depending upon which area we are uh, connected within the bank. Okay, that's that's cool. Then then don't have much restrictions like time. like you have restrictions but a transform a healthy a healthy environment where one can get an open environment to correct not really answer. open uh, by their choice but by the type of application they are working type of application correct yeah. got it got it here also we are following same hired or my managers or yeah my yeah bosses they are hired for same but uh, attend in one year here in current organ things won't change as you want especially in bank and if it is a big uh, uh, organization it takes time and things move very slowly but uh, but again we are trying to set up something which we may see after couple of years yeah that's pretty from my all end. right uh, devadesh i'll uh, close the interview for now and then uh, i'll share the feature sure. sure sure thank you nice talking thank to you, you. thanks yeah, same bye way. bye
some details about yourself and uh, then we can start the discussion. You can. Okay. Hi, good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving this up for introduced myself. I'm Gopinath. I am belong to Eero district uh, Madakurchi uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu. I am currently living in Chennai. I, uh, in my family, totally five numbers, including my father and my mother. I have two elder sisters, including myself. I am completed a graduation in Sri Vengadeshwara High Tech Engineering College. And I did my uh, PG graduation in uh, Kumaraguru College of Technology. Mm, my hobbies are uh, playing games and uh, traveling in uh, nearby areas, uh, nearby tourist areas. My strengths are honestly speak uh, self-motivated patience, hard worker and self learner. Uh, my short term goal is uh, get a job in reputed company. My long term goal is I get a, a good job and a reputed position in organization. Mm, I'm completed in a, a, AWS, uh, a, AWS course and a general work. And I have AWS solution architecture level set. And, and I know uh, basics levels of uh, Azure Cloud also. So you um, have just finished your graduation this year? No, no, I'm finishing uh, previously. Uh, in between gap, I am doing my business. You are doing your business? Yeah. What what business is that? Uh, hotel and bakery kind of business. Uh, I am a partner of one mobile shops also. But now I am uh, closing my business. I am doing for, facing for IT. Because okay. of COVID, after COVID, I lost. So last one year, you are mainly into business? Yeah, I am doing my, I am doing my course and etc. What course have you, uh, like apart from graduation, what, what courses and certifications that you have done? Uh, AWS and the general DevOps. I am completing the uh, AWS solution architecture certification. So you have done the uh, AWS uh, certification? Yeah, certification. Yeah. When did you do that? Uh, October. October, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, October, uh, I'm uh, working in four months in one company. Uh, you and yeah, I'm working in four months in one company. What what kind of uh, work were you involved there? Uh, actually, I'm going to attend the interview for AWS and general DevOps, but they are giving for uh, uh, Azure Cloud and uh, Azure DevOps. Uh, I learn, I'm learning in the band of process. Uh, I'm the only one person of uh, cloud and DevOps uh, and that particular company. Uh, so uh, facing more uh, pressure and uh, they are giving for implementation purpose. The company moving to cloud and DevOps implementation purpose. Uh, they're giving more tasks for me. Uh, and they, no one can guide me. I'm only one person on uh, cloud and so no one. So you can are still working me. there or you quit? quit uh, no, place? I'm quite. Uh, I'm quit the job because no so one you... can help me. No one can help me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm asking for help. Uh, they tell me uh, you self planning. I uh, expect uh, somehow complicated are that. Uh, how can I self plan for everything? So give me some example. What kind of help you needed? Uh, where were you stuck? Uh, I'm using uh, stuck with. Uh, uh, but uh, to sonar cube i didn't know the sonar cube uh, mm -hmm. they are implementing into sonar cube and devops group uh, but i didn't know i'm facing many errors uh, i asked for doubt but they didn't uh, they say that simply uh, you search it in google and try it and i'm facing a lot of uh, struggles in that company if so we hire you we will say the exactly the same thing Go to YouTube. There are uh, probably hundreds of videos on YouTube to yeah. integrate. Yeah, but, uh, but but AWS uh, many videos are available. I am searching for it in Azure, and uh, the contents are world. They are updating the server. Uh, I couldn't get the resource, uh, so I am struggling a lot. Uh, so in AWS, we have a lot of lessons. Uh, why lessons why I you know. have to? No, why you have to quit and then be without a job and then search for a job? You can continue there. And in parallel, search for a job. Um, yeah, because of more stress is there now. More stress putting on me one side. Uh, because of they are moving to partnership with uh, Azure Cloud. Uh, okay. So they are forcing, uh, forcing uh, immediately finish the job. Immediately finish the job. They are forcing me. But mm -hmm. I didn't understand few of things. Uh, how I finished it quickly. Correct, 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 correct. So is that a problem that you want to work on only on AWS or? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, if you're giving time, I learn with uh, Azure also. Um, okay. I know Azure basics, uh, but I didn't know very well. Hmm. Okay. That that creates a bit of problem. What what other examples where you were stuck and there was no help to you? Um, because Sonar yeah. is not not 
mandatory right if sonar is not yeah, yeah. integrated yeah the business in will that, not go in down. that yeah in that time uh, in azure uh, cicd also i didn't know the azure cicd what is working <laughs> I, i know general cic uh, general in jenkins uh, cicd right. but uh, azure i didn't know uh, each uh, each kind of they, they are writing script i write in the script uh, every time uh, it's showing some error like that i asked him but i didn't know the, i'm not a programmer person i am asking for a doubt uh, 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 they are know in the yaml script uh, that kind of things also i asked him but a uh, simple time error uh, but uh, uh, they didn't response me i called so many times so they didn't response me they are in uh, another branch working in another branch developer working in another branch uh, i frequently calling him uh, they are didn't response but you have done like uh, uh... four years uh, you have done graduation and then you have done masters also yeah i done masters also after that i am doing my business so, at the time i am interested in doing business that's why I'm, so how I'm come this sudden change uh, that uh, after covid uh, i have no uh, hope i didn't have enough money to run the mm-hmm. so uh, i am already studying in computer background now so i am studying uh, so i join the course and uh, it may uh, this course. is see cicd and sonar cube integration are relatively easier uh, scenarios you will yeah. find lot of information documentation and stuff that uh, somebody who is a graduate and master in computer science and it's not even other other uh, branches yeah but uh, i am a career guy now but and you are also saying you are not a programmer so yeah i am not a programmer uh, at the time i know the programs uh, mm-hmm. but uh, for uh, gaps uh, i am facing logic errors i mm. couldn't understand the logic what what did you do in during your uh, graduation any any internship or anything no i am doing my own project uh, iot project what was your uh, major final year project that you worked on uh, parking system okay how does that uh, uh, give you some idea um, how uh, parking system is a close range parking system we got used to sensors uh, if a car coming uh, rfid tag you uh, should for uh, the booking the slot already we are booking the slot rfid tag you should to verify the, whether the person is a uh, correct person or booking the slot and uh, um, uh, after uh, they going for it automatically payment payment method is for um uh, upi like the, like that card or upi the kind mm-hmm. of payment method yeah uh, we should for um, uh, sensors also including uh, uh, the back side parking we are going to uh, we are not uh, stuck within wall uh, wall background wall that kind of things i am using sensors also. where were you storing all this information <laughs> my uh, on php php website i am using uh, and mobile using i am right Uh, and storing with a, a database uh, that can help with uh, my my colleague my one of my colleague uh, uh, storing with sql did you develop it yourself or you found it somewhere i uh, i uh, i found it uh, i uh, partially developed partially found it uh, from other code hmm. right right that's how usually people do it hmm. right so um, so gopi the problem is that uh, you you have mentioned all the technologies in your resume you have all probably an architect would be uh, afraid to write these all these skills docker kubernetes yeah i know docker else. basics how to create the docker uh, and inside install that mm-hmm. uh, okay. docker files and how to install can inside you the... can you uh, you are on laptop right yeah can you write a docker file on notepad and share screen with me mm, yeah let's do it quickly okay just a blank notepad and one write one docker file and just uh, also in parallel uh, screen share okay one second is it going to take time no wait uh, now i view my screen yeah i can see let's write okay. a docker file uh, um, i am writing a simple docker file mm-hmm. also keep explaining like what you are writing what what does that mean oh, okay. uh, from umundo the docker file the right starting with a, a caps letters only um i'm run shit what will this line do uh, from ubuntu uh, from uh, ubuntu is a uh, user name like that uh, i am using from gobi or something like that uh, i am using when ubuntu is a user name i am update my file inside uh, inside i am uh, using ubuntu yes i am update update my os 
I am uh, run a uh, install to Apache 2. Uh, add, I am, uh, I am adding the to, to default directory. Can you explain like what when you are writing? I am simply running the, uh, simply uh, launching the Apache 2 instance inside that. And what is this env doing? Uh, that is a uh, environment uh, We can uh, enter the, um, uh, like that. Um, Username, that kind of thing. So your first line was also username. This is also username. No, no. First line was uh, from uh, Ubuntu. Uh, that's uh, that's kind of the um, uh, thing is I'm I'm the creating. Uh, that's good. I can use it uh, from uh, Gobi also in first line. Or you can use your name as well. Yeah. That doesn't matter. Whatever we write there, first line is. Yeah. It's a comment kind of thing. Yeah. But how will I access this file now? Uh, first, uh, you can bolt it the file. Uh, sudo docker bold uh, dot uh, space hyphen d uh, you're giving in some name uh, i'm giving apache uh, version 1.2 something like that uh, mm -hmm. and that uh, after that i am uh, running the image sudo docker run uh, image name uh, sudo docker run uh, space it uh, space uh, d image name that kind of thing after that i am execute it uh, with the bash container ready bash Great. I think we can. Uh, any any other area you want to show your coding skills? You you comfortable with something Python or? Uh, uh, no, or... I I done my Python skills, but uh, I'm searching for cloud now. Uh, cloud in the cloud or uh, mainly focus on cloud and uh, basic uh, DevOps general DevOps. Mm -hmm. so that's why uh, once I once I uh, recall it, I done it, but now immediately I couldn't. Okay, no worries. Just just tell me a bit about what's your understanding of the uh, term DevOps. Yeah, uh, DevOps. Uh, DevOps uh, nowadays uh, DevOps is a piece. Uh, because uh, our olden days we are using Agile and other waterfall technology, other technology. Uh, we are using uh, DevOps uh, more time saving. Uh, easily get a quick response with uh, uh, users and uh, we can easily buy, uh, ratify the errors. Uh, immediately solving uh, we can uh, planning to less time uh, in uh, previous uh, technologies is for in any errors we are working with uh, uh, starting and uh, but this technology we are using by particularly find where is its error where we can solve it immediately uh, we are using in continuous integration and uh, continuous deployment uh, we are using in every step uh, the, the developer develop the code uh, we can uh, uh, we can test it and uh, basic bugs also uh, get immediately. Uh, we can ratify it immediately. Okay, cool. Fine. Uh, okay, that's that's all I wanted to uh, discuss uh, for now. Uh, I'll uh, make some notes as to what your key strengths are, and then we'll we'll get back to you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you're you so from, much. You are from.